This subject of Akhiru Zaman, the end of times, or Ashratu Sa'a, the signs of the end of times, is a subject which has been served the least from the Islamic ulum, the Islamic sciences. Therefore, the subject deserves more attention today than ever before because as a day goes by, we draw closer to Yawmul Qiyamah. And of course, there are many technical things to look at before even delving into the subject. This subject is inheritance from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when teaching this subject in Al Masjid Al Nabawi Al Sharif, he laid down the guidelines regarding. Ashratu Sa'u, the signs of the end of times, and stated, Yahmilu hadha l'ilma min kulli khalafin uduluhu, that will carry this knowledge, Yahmilu hadha l'ilm, will carry this knowledge, meaning all the knowledge that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa left behind, min kulli khalafin from every generation, khalaf here means those who are left behind from their predecessors. Uduluhu, the upright people. Udul meaning they are trustworthy in transmitting this knowledge. And this would include Ashratu Sa'a, the signs of the end of times, and Ilmu Akhir Zaman, the knowledge of the end of times. But in the hadith of Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam, the famous hadith, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was sitting in Al Masjid al Nabawi, and a man came and asked questions and later on the companions were informed that the man who had arrived was Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam. This questioner Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salam asked regarding four things. One was Al-Islam, the second was Al-Iman, the third was Al-Ihsan, the fourth was regarding Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the time and occurrence of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded by saying, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ That the one quest being questioned knows just as much as the one questioning regarding it. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed Sayyiduna Jibreel Alayhi Salaam regarding the Ashratu Sa'a. These four subjects that were mentioned, we would refer to as Al Arkanul Arba'a, the four pillars of the religion. What is the main distinction between these four pillars? With the first pillar, which is Al Islam, we know the religion of Islam is what we term today as Al Fiqh or Al Sharia. Al Fiqh. Uh, jurisprudence, a sharia, the law. The second one, which is al iman, is what is referred to as ilmul kalam, the science of rational theology relating to belief, the creed. The third one, which is al ihsan, the state of perfection, is known as tasawwuf, the, the state of ex excellence and purifying oneself. The fourth knowledge is ilmu akhir zaman, the knowledge of the end of times or knowing the signs before the end of times. But what do we observe from the four, the first three, these are distinctions that you must bear in mind. The first three have been served to a point where there is not much to add. Like al-fiqh, has been served by the scholars to such a degree that the scholars of Islam have written extensive works co codifying the Sharia, the law, in extensive works like Majallatul Ahkam, which was the uh, code of law for the Ottoman Caliphate, or so many other different works from the time 
of Al Imam Muhammad bin Idris al Shafi'i, who wrote down a risala to the time of Al Imam Yahya bin Sharaf al Nawawi, Rahimallah Ta'ala, who wrote Al Majmu' Sharh al Muhaddab. And throughout history, up to the likes of Umar bin Abidin, who wrote the Hashia known as Raddul Muhtar, the knowledge of fiqh jurisprudence has been served extensively that the scholars have written works that are expansive and voluminous that we can refer back to those works at any time for any legal ruling. The second one, Ilmul Kalam, likewise, whenever heresy arose in an Islamic society in Baghdad in the early period of the Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas, the scholars, they wrote works on theology, which is Ilmul Kalam, also known as Al-Iman in the Hadith of Jibreel Ali Salam. The third one, which is Al-Ihsan, the state of perfection, you had great ulama like Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al-Jilani and before him, the author of Al-Risalat al known as Al-Imam al Qushayri, or Abu Talib Al-Makki, the author of Qut al Qulub, or Al-Imam Abu Hamid Muhammad Al-Ghazali, who contributed to all three uh, pillars of fiqh, uh, jurisprudence, ilm al-kalam, which is aqidah, belief, as well as al-ihsan, which is known as tasawwuf. The fourth pillar, which is ilm akhir zaman the knowledge of the end of times, was not served in the same way as the previous three. This is a major distinction. What happened with ilm akhir zaman that scholars recorded the hadith of Akhirul Zaman in their collections. So if we check the collections from the time of Al-Imam Muhammad bin Ismail al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala and Al-Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj al-Qushayri and all the authors of the works of hadith, some of them placed chapter headings in their works on the end of times, but with no order. Meaning, if someone picks up a work of hadith like a tirmidhi the jami' of al-imam al-tirmidhi and he goes and checks kitab al-tahara would he be able to extract legal rulings independently the answer is no for the legal rulings what will the person do he will refer back to the works of jurisprudence the works of al-fiqh likewise to check an opinion on aqidah belief a person would refer back to the works of Ilm al Kalam. Likewise, with Al Ihsan, a person would refer to the works of Ihsan or to the Mashaykh, the leading scholars of that time. And if there are no available Mashaykh, they would refer back to the works like Ihya or Ulum al Deen. But Ilm al Akhir al Zaman, Ashratu Sa'a, was such that the scholars left the hadith sometimes without commenting on the hadith. Why was this? Because the signs that had not occurred, the scholars did not delve into how they will occur and when they will occur. Because this was relating to the knowledge of the unseen. But they did compile works specifically for the end of times. Like Nu'aym bin Hammad, he wrote his work Al-Fitan, famous work on Ashratu uh, Sa'a, Nu'aym bin Hammad was the teacher of Imam Bukhari, one of his mashaykh. His work is one of the earliest works on Ashratu Sa'a, which Alhamdulillah in the previous seminars was referenced comprehensively. But there are certain hadith in there that a person can only understand once the sign has occurred. Like if you remember when this group referring to itself as Daesh, which is Dawlatul Islam fil Iraqi wa Sham, also known as ISIS, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. When they appeared, people made reference to a work of hadith, which was the work of hadith of Nuwaim bin Hamad, 
regarding a group of people that shall appear in the end of times whose hearts shall be harder than iron and they shall use agnomens, meaning referring to themselves as Abu, like Abu Fulan and Abu Fulan, and they shall ascribe themselves to towns and cities. That hadith is found in Nu'im bin Hamad's book Al-Fitan, which was compiled before the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. But the application of the hadith has been neg neglected. Why has it been neglected? Not because the scholars of Islam were negligent. No, it was because the scholars were waiting for the period of time in which those signs will start to occur so they can comment. Otherwise, as I will go into later, there are some hadith that we may read, that we may understand in a specific way, but when the sign occurs, it becomes clear what was actually meant. We may have misunderstood what was meant by the hadith prior to the sign occurring. So, the ruknul rabi' the fourth pillar of this of the religion of Islam is Ashratu Sa'a. This is very important to understand because there are some people who undermine this subject. They undermine the subject. They say, what is the purpose of holding events on a Dajjal or holding events on Akhirul Zaman? Uh, what is the purpose of just entertaining the public? Because some of them think that this is done for entertainment purposes. But the reality is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught this subject like the previous three subjects. The way a Sahabi would be taught the legal rulings of Istinja, cleaning oneself after relieving oneself, how to carry out the acts of worship, Salah, how to carry out the acts of Hajj, all the things relating to Al-Fiqh. Likewise, the companions were taught belief, correct belief. Likewise, the companions were taught uh, a tazkiyah or known as al-ihsan, perfect, perfecting the ibadah, the acts of worship. They were taught ashratu sa'a, that the companions state that when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would discuss ad dajjal the siva in the end of times, it were as if he was located in the date trees nearby, meaning this was done for a purpose. And one of the most authoritative works on Akhirul Zaman, which is the work of Al Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Rasul al Barzanji, Al Isha'a, Li Ashrati Sa'a. In that work, in the introductions, this is a work that was compiled hundreds of years after the work of Nu'aym bin Hamad. He writes that the purpose of compiling the work was that when people read on the Ashratu Sa'a, they become frightened and they stop sinning. Meaning there was a purpose behind writing, uh, frightened of what? Frightened of the impending punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for some of the sins that people may be doing. That when they read Ashratu Sa'a, this will soften their hearts realizing that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold these signs and they will desist from sinning and carrying out certain sins. Meaning this is, an act, this is something that softens the heart. So there is a purpose in studying this. But there is something greater also to be observed. That is that the previous three subjects Al-Islam, Al-Iman and Al-Ihsan. What is an, an additional distinction between these three and Ilmu Akhir Zaman? That distinction is the following. That the previous three we would refer to as Al-Thawabit and the fourth one we would refer to as Fiqh Al-Tahawulat. What is the distinction? The first three are something which are firm and fixed. Your belief never changes. The rules and regulations and maxims of fiqh, jurisprudence, don't change with time. Meaning, a legal ruling can change, but the legal maxims and how one derives the legal rulings is firm. Some of the legal rulings never change. 
Likewise, al-ihsan, spirituality, observance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never changes. These three are known as al-thawabit. What is the distinction between these three and the fourth, which is ilmu akhir zaman, the knowledge of the end of times, which some refer to as eschatology, is that the fourth one changes. So we would refer to this as fiqh tahawulat knowing and understanding the changes that occur. If one observes the world around them and everything that changes with time, they will know that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold the changing periods of time, the changes that occur in people, the changes that even occur in Umur Kawniya. Umur Kawniya means universal laws or earthquakes and uh, you, uh, disaster, natural disasters which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold. All of this is known as fiqh tahawulat understanding the changing universe and the world around us. So the fourth knowledge relates to understanding the changes that are occurring around us. Additional to that, that this fourth knowledge, when we observe this fourth knowledge that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left for us, which I refer to as uh, as Ar-Ruknu uh, Rabi' the fourth pillar, the fourth pillar of, of the religion that a person needs to know. They safeguard themselves from fit and tribulations. When a person has knowledge of this, he safeguards himself from various tribulations. Now, the signs of the end of times are what we refer to as umur kawniya qadariya. What does this mean? It means that these are matters determined by the divine will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A human being has no hand in changing the affairs and judgment of divine judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for the destruction of a nation, a human being cannot change that time and place. So these are umur, kawniya, qadariya. These are things that we have no choice in that they will occur. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, foretold that these signs shall occur. And they shall occur the way the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold. The issue with people studying this subject is that they would become confused regarding its order. A tartibu zamani, meaning a tartibu zamani would mean in what order will the signs occur? And this is what leads to confusion, that people become confused, that they read some of the hadith relating to the end of times, they do not know in what order will the signs take place. Additional to that, how to apply the correct methodology in understanding those signs. So if someone attempts to bring about the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi, they will not be able to do so. Why? Because the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an, or the appearance of the false messiah al-Dajjal is only with the divine will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This draws a distinction between the Muslim belief regarding the signs of the end of times and the Christian evangelist belief of some Christian groups that they believe that their actions will bring about the end of times. Of course, in the previous past, there have been misguided groups of Muslims who have attempted to do the same. And we covered some of those in the early seminars, like the, uh, the group of uh, Al-Utaybi, who, what did they do? They hijacked the Haram, the Al Masjid Al Haram, and uh, then they were killed. But what did they attempt to do? Bring about the end of times. Some of the people who joined ISIS, what did they do? They believed this was the end of times occurring, and they attempted to place a blockade on the water of the Euphrates River, attempted, attempting to bring in the end of times. But this is a false belief. So this is, these principles that I have mentioned are very essential in understanding the subject in itself. Now, where do we stand in terms of a timeline? 
because in terms of a timeline, where are we currently situated in the timeline? Because remember, the ilm akhir zaman relates to the awwal zaman from the time of Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam and the creation of Adam alayhi salam up to the bi'tha, the sending of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and then the signs that occurred after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was sent up to our time where we stand and then after where we are what signs shall occur we know the major signs shall occur because they have not occurred from the appearance of al-imam al-mahdi to the appearance of dajjal and others and again with that timeline also there are people confusing many people that some think that a dajjal will appear first malhama shall happen first then a dajjal shall appear then al-mahdi shall appear that's confusing the timeline which we will go into today insha'Allah ta'ala but what was foretold by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was firstly what we would refer to as marhalatul risala was the time when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came unto earth marhalatul risala and this period of time was marked by so many signs like the splitting of the moon and the ashratul sa'ad that occurred like the, pe- the pebbles speaking uh, on the hands of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and various signs that occurred. After the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, you have marhalatul khulafa, the period of time <coughs> where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al khulafa ir rashidina al mahdiyina min ba'di. Follow my prophetic way and the way of the, uh, the successors, Ar Rashidin, rightly guided Al Mahdiyin, Min Ba'di. This is known as Marhalatul Khulafa. But things were foretold. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, foretold the martyrdom of Sayyiduna Uthman radiallahu an and the fighting that shall occur. All of these different signs that we covered in the first seminar. Then the third period. Marhalatul Mulkil Adud, which is what? The biting kingship. The word Adud is from Adda. Adda is a verb to mean what? To bite unto something. This Marhala is a long period of time from the time of Bani Umayyah, from the time of Bani Umayyah, all the way up to uh, the Uthmani Caliphate. This is al-mulk, kingship. I mean, it's called kingship because it, uh, how they determined the khalifa was through successorship. Not on the way of the al-khulafa al-rashidun. They had consultation. But this was the period of what? Marhalatul mulk. Al-udud. That um, uh, biting kingship. A long period of time. Then this brings us to the fourth period of time, which we would refer to as Marhalatul Ghutha, the period of the, the froth of the sea. This is the period that we are in, and later on, inshallah, I shall go into detail regarding that period. So, if we divided the periods prior to the appearance of Al Imam al Mahdi, we would divide it into these four periods Marhalatul Risala. The time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Marhalatul Khulafa, which was the rightly guided caliphs, and then from the rightly guided caliphs to Marhalatul Mulk, the period of kingship, which extended from Bani Umayyah all the way up and including the Ottomans, including that period, Marhalatul Mulk. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold in a famous hadith that this period, I mean the Ghutha, the fourth, this period of time will have, have uh, the, uh, which is referred to as al Jabariya, that the Jababira, the tyrants shall rule in this fourth period, al Ghutha. So this is important to understanding the subject in itself. But before I go on to Marhalatul Ghutha, 
the period we live in today, a few rules relating to ilmu akhir zaman, you can say maxims, qawaid, uh, regulations, laws, by how to understand the ahadith, the numerous narrations of the Prophet ﷺ relating to akhir zaman. One of those, and it's very important to know this, is that sometimes something will become more clear after it occurs. A person may read the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and interpret the hadith in numerous, numerous ways, but when the actual sign occurs, the person realizes this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was actually referring to. This is very important. For instance, what was mentioned in previous seminars that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may have foretold or did foretell, prophesize regarding the whip of a man will talk to him. The whip of a man will talk to him. Now imagine a scholar from the 6th century attempting to comment on this. This is why they didn't comment. They, if you check the commentaries of the hadith works, they pass it by or they may mention a few things but they do not go into depth. Why? Because they do not know how this will happen. But in our day and age, where we understand that this refers to technology and the reason why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may have referred to it as a whip is because those being addressed were unfamiliar of what we observe today. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used a term which they were familiar with. Therefore, some of the signs of the end of times cannot be understood until they actually occur. You have two extremes on this. One is the extreme that some people take everything that they read literally. When they take everything literally, uh, they can become a laughing stock for people, meaning how they interpret some of the hadith. And the other extreme is interpretation to the extent that a person falls into what we call takalluf. Takalluf is what? Difficultly attempting to explain everything. Like one person now referring to Dabatul Ard, the earth crawler, as the mobile phone. That the smartphone that we use is Dabatul Ard. This is takalluf in interpretation. The hallmark of a correct interpretation is that when the sign shall occur, and once the sign has occurred, there is no room for interpretation. Like the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, a man shall leave the house and his thigh, his thigh will tell him what his family has done when he has left the home. Now if a person a hundred years ago attempted to interpret this with numerous interpretations, when the sign has occurred, those interpretations would, uh, would uh, fall short. But once the sign has occurred, which is in our lifetimes, we know what the sign is. That people have recording devices that they may place on their, on their thigh and then they can check uh, with the recording devices. Now even on the smartphone people can check cameras inside of their homes. So this is a very important rule in understanding the signs of the end of times. Additional to that, there is those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden and their meaning shall never be understood until it occurs. There are certain segments and aspects of ilmu akhir zaman that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden and they can never be understood until they occur. There's an important point to mention here. Does this mean they contradict the rational faculty? The answer is no. It does not mean that it contradicts the rational faculty because Islam is a rational belief. Meaning, when we believe in angels, it's not an irrational belief. There's a distinction between irrationality and being familiar with something. Being familiar with something is that you observe something and you can imagine how that thing will be. But something can be rational, but you cannot imagine how it will be. 
It can be rational, it can occur, meaning it fall under a rational judgment, but because you never observed anything of its kind, you can never know how will it look like. So when, for instance, some of the signs of the end of times are mentioned, we can, we can know that this thing is rationally possible. But how it will be, we will never know until it actually occurs. But some people, they attempt to find out regarding those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden from us. Al-Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, one of the imams of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, he states, Inna Allah arada bina ashya'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended with us certain things. وَأَرَادَ مِنَّا أَشْيَاء And He willed for, for us to carry out certain things. Two things. One is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted from us and then there are those things what Allah, not wanted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from want. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demanded from us and there are those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for us two different things what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for us he hid it from us meaning what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed for what, what type of rizq sustenance you will have tomorrow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed on certain ashratu sa'a that will occur but likewise, وَمَا أَرَادَهُ مِنَّا بَيَّنَهُ لَنَا what he, want, what he wills for us to carry out, he explained to us. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demanded from us to pray our five salah, our five daily prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demanded from us to give our zakatul amwal, our charity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demanded very, various things. فَمَا بَالُونَا then what is it with us? فَمَا بَالُنَا نَشْغَلُ لِمَا أَرَادَهُ بِنَا عَمَّا أَرَادَهُ مِنَّا That we become busy with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guaranteed for us that will occur but we are not busying ourselves with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has demanded from us. This is a statement of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq which applies to those who attempt to find out regarding things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden and has not revealed and they will only become revealed when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to be revealed and this is the main significance of Surah Al-Kahf because Surah Al-Kahf relates to those things which were hidden how in, the, in Surah Al-Kahf you have the story of Dhul Qarnayn alayhi salam who hid a group of people behind the barrier which we shall go into later which is known as Ya'juj and Ma'juj. In Surah Al-Kahf you have the sleepers, the seven sleepers and they dug that stayed asleep for 300 years in a cave hidden from humanity. In Surah Al-Kahf you have the story of Khidr salam and Musa salam that certain type of knowledge was hidden from Musa salam until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed that meaning Sayyidina Khidr salam revealed that with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the knowledge was initially hidden. So Surah Al-Kahf which is the chapter of the end of times, which is read every Friday to protect ourselves from the fitna, tribulation of a Dajjal, is a chapter which mentions that knowledge which is hidden. But within Surah Al-Kahf, there is an allusion to a Dajjal because a Dajjal will remain hidden until his appearance. Even though he's hidden, does this mean his fitna, tribulation is not around? The answer is no. The tribulation remain, remains because as I will mention shortly, there is a hadith which explicitly states that any tribulation that occurs is in preparation for Dajjal. So, 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left certain things through indication, isharat in the hadith. Sometimes those who have deep penetrating insight can extract an understanding which is correct. So this is not closing the door for people studying ilmu akhir zaman, no. For instance, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before passing away addressed his wives. He said, kunna lihaqan bi, kunna yadan. The first one of you that shall meet me, meaning pass away, the first one that shall pass away from amongst you, shall be the one with the longest hand. Shall be the one with the longest hand. So the wives of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they all went and placed their hands against the wall and they measured the hands and one of them may have had the longest hand and they thought she will be the first one to pass away when the first one who passed away passed away they realized that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not referring to the actual physical length of the hands he was referring to sadaqat, charity, because that particular wife, as mentioned in the narration, was the one who would give the most charity out to the poor. So this shows that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this science, which is fiqh tahawulat, the understanding of change that occurs, will sometimes use indications in the hadith. This is different to uh, the methodology of the Salaf, pseudo Salafis that they may not understand certain ahadith in their correct way but did the companions understand such things the answer is yes famous incident when surah uh, suratul uh, nasr was revealed idha jaa nasrullahi wal fath that this Small chapter in Juz Amma, when it was revealed, the companions were happy that it shows the victory of Islam. But they heard a person crying and it was Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. And the younger companions, they said, why is this old man crying? It was because Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh understood from the chapter that this was signifying the passing away of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh had more penetrating insight regarding the revelation of a chapter which was, dis, which was mentioning the victory of Islam. But this penetrating insight is what the scholar of Akhir zaman has, meaning those who have irfan, a knowledge or ilm ladunni, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا عِلْمْ لَدُنِّي Knowledge which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to people, a penetrating insight. But there is a fine line between this and distorting the text. And it is that fine line which makes people fall into mistakes. Meaning, someone who doesn't follow a pseudo-Salafi methodology, but follows a proclaimed Sufi methodology, can fall into the method of the Batiniya, a, 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 a heretical sect that misinterpreted so many hadith and verses of the Quran totally. So there is a precise method in interpreting those hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if a person does not have the correct method, they will fall into uh, total disregard of those hadith which will go on to some of them later. The, some of the terms that are mentioned in Ashratu Sa'a in the signs of the end of times, one word is fitan. Fitan is plural of fitna, tribulations. Those tribulations relate to an individual or to society as a whole. That a person can be in a tribulation individually, in a fitna. Likewise, there could be tribulations 
in society. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, foretold all these changes that shall occur in society as well, with the, as, well as the individual. Like he said, مَا تَرَقْتُ فِتْنَةً أَعْظَمَ لِرِجَالِ أُمَّتِي مِنَ النِّسَاءِ I have not left a fitna, a tribulation, greater for the men of my nation than women. And in another narration, uh, the, the men are a fitna for the women also. The men are a tribulation for the women. This is referring to uh, a, a type of fitna. Like, but mudillatul fitan are those fitan tribulations that misguide people. Like, a dajjal is the greatest fitna, greatest tribulation, because he misguides people in their belief. So, the word fitan, tribulation, has its various meanings. It can refer to tribulation in wealth. Tribulation in family, tribulation with the self, tribulation with laziness, tribulation with society. This is one of the understandings a person should have with regard to ilmu akhir zaman. There is also a term ashratu sa'a. Ashratu sa'a is the, the signposts of the hour. Like, the word is plural of shart. That before a sign, before a major sign occurs, or be, uh, before the day of judgment occurs, there are signposts before the day of judgment that this signpost signifies the occurrence of the day of judgment. Additional to that, you have alama to sa'a, which comes in the same meaning, the same meaning as ashra to sa'a, or amarat, amarat to sa'a. Or malahim, malahim is plural of malhama, the battles that shall occur before the hour. But there is also bisharat, glad tidings before the hour. So this is something neglected, meaning people look at the, only observe the negative signs of the Day of Judgment, but there are also positive signs like the descent of Isa alayhi salam, the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi, and so many other positive signs which are known as bisharat, before the Day of Judgment. Now, before I go into Marhalatul Ghutha, the period of time that we live in, two additional things. One is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لَتُنْقَضَنَّ عُرَ الْإِسْلَامِ عُرْوَةً عُرْوَةً That the Urwa uh, is a handle, but the ties of Islam, لَتُنْقَضَنَّ Ural Islam, the ties of Islam shall be unraveled. Urwatan, Urwatan. One, Urwa, Urwa can mean a, a handle, or a, a, in this case, if you imagine a mat that's stitched, someone pulls out a string, one string being pulled, then another string, then another string, then another string. This shall occur with Islam. كُلَّمَا انتقضت عُرْوَةٌ Each time whenever one urwa is unraveled, تَشَبَّثَ النَّاسُ بِالَّتِي تَلِيهَا People shall grasp onto the urwa that comes after. Now, what does this hadith entail? That Islam, remember, I mentioned الْأَرْكَانُ الْأَرْبَعَةِ The four pillars. Uh, don't get confused with the five pillars of Islam, meaning the four foundations of the religion. What were they? Al-Islam, Al-Iman, Al-Ihsan, Ashratu Sa'a. These four foundations of the religion. Do they submerge? They do. How do they submerge? When a fitna tribulation occurs, it's one of the signs of the end of times. That sign can affect your Iman. That sign can affect your worship. That sign can affect your relationship with Allah. Do you see how they are linked? Meaning, a person faces a tribulation, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. It shall affect his Islam. It shall affect his Ihsan. It shall affect his Iman. Therefore, having knowledge of all four is essential. A person cannot concentrate only on ilmu akhir zaman and neglect aqidah, belief. A person cannot only concentrate on belief and neglect ilmu akhir zaman. A person cannot look at only one segment of the religion. They, a scholar of Islam must have deep knowledge and understanding of all the foundations of the religion. So 
the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when one urwa, when one aspect is done away with, people shall grasp one to the other. What shall be the first one? Awaluhunna naqdan al hukmu. The first thing that shall be unraveled is governing, Islamic governance. When did that occur? It occurred with the abolishing, uh, the abolishment of the Khilafah. That Muslims are not ruled with Al-Hukm. So this sign has occurred. It only occurred a hundred years ago or about a hundred years ago. But the last one, وَآخِرُهُنَّ الصَّلَاةُ The last one is the Salah. So, لَتُنْقَضَنَّ عُرَى الْإِسْلَامِ عُرْوَةً عُرْوَةً the, those things which tie the religion together shall be unraveled one by one. The first one shall be governance. The last one shall be the salah. So this happened when? Over a hundred years ago. Someone may say, okay, the rulers prior, they were not pious. No one is saying they were pious. They ruled and governed with Islam. Islam, the Muslims were independent economically, politically and militarily. They had economic independence. This is why there is a great difference between the Crusader period and the Zionist occupation today. Because today we have no economic independence. Salahuddin al Ayyubi had economic independence. He was not dependent on the Crusaders. But the Arabs today are dependent on the Zionists in their economy. So... لَتُنْقَضَنَّ عُرَى الْإِسْلَامِ عُرْوَةً عُرْوَةً The first uh, thing to be untied will be Islamic governance. The last one shall be the Salah. This is very important. <clears throat> now the Hadith, before we go into the periods of time, or the specific period of time that we are in, there is a Hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Regarding a Dajjal, which I said I will mention, which is وَمَا سُنِعَتْ فِتْنَةٌ مُنذُ كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا تَضَعُوا لِفِتْنَةِ الدَّجَّال This hadith has been narrated by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, Ibn Hibban in his Sahih, which is what? No fitna, tribulation is manufactured. A small tribulation or a large tribulation prior to the appearance of a Dajjal, prior to his appearance, except it is in preparation for a Dajjal. This now makes us understand that when people say Dajjalic age, even though the term could be questionable because no... <clears throat> The Dajjal doesn't control the age. The term could be questionable. But people say this is the Dajjalic fitna. Is this term correct? The answer is yes. Every fitna tribulation can be referred to as the Dajjalic fitna. Why? Because based on this hadith, every fitna tribulation that is manufactured, suni'at, literally manufactured, it is in preparation for the appearance of a Dajjal. So... <clears throat> the periods of time that we live in, I said to you that we have Marhalatul Risala, then Marhalatul Khulafa, then Mar Marhalatul Mulk al Udud, then the last one was Marhalatul Ghutha. Now, this Marhalatul Ghutha is what we will investigate. This period of time that we live in, firstly, the sign لَتُنْقَضَنَّ عُرَى الْإِسْلَامِ عُرْوَةً عُرْوَةً that the ties of Islam will be unraveled. That has occurred, the first one has occurred which is Al-Hukm. So we know that has occurred. That governance is missing. This is why people will find practicing the religion hard in the end of times. Because when you have Islamic governance, it helps people in practicing their religion. It can, it's a helping feature. It doesn't mean everyone will be pious, but those who want to practice their religion correctly, they can go to a society where they would not be forced to take interest-based loans. They will go to a society where they will not be forced to do certain uh, impermissible things. 
or, um, not forced, but circumstances will not lead them to doing certain haram things. So this period of time, which is Marhalatul Ghuthab, how did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describe this period? Uh, firstly, within this period, we have the rulership of tyrants, which is not hidden from an, anyone, because the famous hadith mentions the, the order after the prophethood, caliphate on the prophetic way. After the prophetic way, caliphate will be al-mulk, successorship. After the successorship, there shall be tyrants. This period of tyranny, why is it called al-ghutha? Because of a famous hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, relating to the influx of foreign nations invading the invasions that shall occur what does the hadith state uh, the hadith states and this is a famous hadith many of you have heard this hadith before yushiku yushiku an tada'a alaykum al umam that the nations shall call upon you yushiku meaning this, this shall occur kama like the eaters, they call upon people to eat from a platter. And the word used is al-umam. What is the United Nations referred to today in Arabic when you say United Nations? Al-umam al-muttahida. The United Nations, over 180 nations. Al-umam al-muttahida. The hadith states that the nations shall call upon you. قَالُوا أَمِنْ قِلَّةٍ نَحْنُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Is it because we are small in number? We, will we be small in number, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لَا أَنْتُمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ كَثِيرٌ You will be numerous, meaning we number today over 1.2 billion. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ غُثَاءٌ But you will be غُثَاء. This is why I've referred to this period as مَرْحَلَةُ الْغُثَاءُ you will be ghutha. What is ghutha? Ghutha is the froth that develops on top of the sea. When the sea waves roll, uh, they go back and forth. You'll see a froth that develops at the top. When you touch the froth, the froth has no substance. Unlike the sea, unlike the water. So meaning you'll be numerous but with no substance, no depth. al ghutha 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 is sayli. Yulqa alaykum al wahan that you'll be like the the froth of the sea. Yulqa alaykum al wahan. Wahan shall be placed in you. Wahan. This is a term used, meaning you can refer to this period as marhalatul wahan or marhalatul ghutha. They said, "What is al wahan?" So they asked, "What what is al wahan?" The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Hubb al dunya wa karahiyat al maut." A love of the world and a dislike for death, meaning fighting in the way of Allah. The fear fact, al mahaba, is when someone finds awe in another individual, the awe shall be removed from your enemies. So, this period of uh, which is known as Marhalatul Ghutha, this first part signifies. If we divide it, Marhalatul Ghutha, you can say this is Marhalatul Tada'i, the period of time when the nation shall call upon one another to eat from the platter. What was the platter? The, the caliphate, the, the, the natural resources of the Muslim world, literally being eaten. So with the NATO invasions of different countries also, meaning this continues, Marhalatul Tada'i. The period of time of calling upon one another. This is that period of time. But when did it start? It started well over a hundred years ago. Really, it started more than uh, over 300 years because when the British invaded Kuwait and then from Kuwait and the East India Company and all this history of the people, uh, the Portuguese and Vasco da Gama and the, the naval crusades and how even Columbus writes in his diaries how he was intending to go to get the riches of India to take back Jerusalem. 
meaning Columbus, in his diaries. He states, why he intended to go to India was to take the wealth of India to take back Jerusalem. This was the purpose. But then in 1492, he stumbled across America and America distracted them for 300 years because they had infighting, distracted them from the main goal. The main goal was Jerusalem. This would be referred to as Marhalatu Tada'i. So the purpose is to understand the timeline of Ashratu Sa'a. Likewise, there is Marhalatu Ahlas. So after you have Marhalatu uh, Tada'i, the nations calling upon one another, now we move on to something which are the fitan tribulations that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam foretold. What were those tribulations? That there shall be four tribulations. Four tribulations. Before the drying of the Euphrates and the appearance of the gold and the appearance of the Sufyani and the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi that there should be four <coughs> tribulations. The first one is referred to as fitna to ahlas. The second one is fitna to sarra. The third one is fitna to duhayma. And the fourth one is fitna to umya. Fitnatul Umya. Fitnatul Ahlas. Meaning we will cover each one. And which one are we in currently? And what shall occur after? And what is the timeline? Fitnatul Ahlas. This fitna, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam said, and remember, there are more than one source for, for this particular hadith. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, they asked, وَمَا فِتْنَةُ الْأَحْلَاسِ What shall be fitnatul الْأَحْلَاسِ When he mentioned it, he said, سَتَكُونُ بَعْدِ الْفِتَنُ They shall be, they shall occur after me, tribulations, fitanu. So note here the term fitan is used, but in a specific meaning. Tribulations shall occur after me. Minha, from amongst those tribulations, fitnatul ahlas. How do we translate this? The tribulation of the saddle cloths. The tribulation of the saddle cloths. Yakunu fiya harbun wa harbun. In that tribulation, there shall be a war. Harbun. Waharbun. And running away. Two things war and running away. Thumma ba'adaha. Fitanun ashaddu minha. Then there shall be tribulations that shall occur after it. Thumma takunu fitnatun kullama qila in qata'at tamadat. Then there shall be tribulations. Whenever it is said that tribulation has finished, it shall continue. Tamadat. Hatta la yabqa baytun illa dakhalatu. Until there is no house except that tribulation enters that house. Wala muslimun. And no muslim illa sakkathu. Except that tribulation has slapped him. Hatta yakhruja rajulun min itrati until a man comes out from my household. Meaning Al-Imam Al-Mahdi radiallahu But here, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guided us towards the different various tribulations. The first one, meaning warning us regarding those tribulations. The first one is referred to as fitna to ahlas. The tribulation of the saddle cloth. Inshallah, after Salatul Maghrib, we shall continue with what is the fitna to ahlas. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على شرف الأنبياء سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين
I mentioned the Fitnatul Ahlas, Fitnatul Sarra, Fitnatul Duhayma, and so the fourth one, Al Fitnatul Umya, Fitnatul Sarra, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned regarding and said, Yakunu fiha harbun wa harbun. In this fitna, meaning the first one, which is fitnatul ahlas, there will be harb and harb. Two words are used, employed. Harb meaning war, harb meaning running away. The word ahlas is from the word hils. Hils is a saddle cloth which is placed on the back of an animal or a spread which is placed upon a couch where people sit but the reason why the tribulation is ascribed to al-ahlas is because the fitna tribulation shall last for a long time and in one hadith the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said kun hilsa baytik that be the saddle cloth of your house, meaning stay in your homes and avoid uh, the tribulation. So this al fitna to sarra, this tribulation occurred during the period of tada'i. So when the nations call upon one another to consume from the platter, in this case being the remnants of the caliphate, this occurred hundreds of years ago when the different nations conspired against the Muslim world for its natural resources as well as when we look at is history from an Islamic perspective, meaning history should always be interpreted from an Islamic perspective as Muslims. We should always interpret history in such a way that when they conspired against the Muslim world not only for its natural resources but also to capture Jerusalem and to finish the Khilafah this tribulation described by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is told as Harb and Harb meaning war and Harb running away the Muslims fighting but running away meaning that they shall be defeated in battle but the tribulation which comes after this is referred to as As-Sarra, which is mentioned. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states, and this is in uh, uh, Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Fitnatul Ahlasi fiya harbun wa harbun. That this, if we translate this, this would mean the saddle cloth tribulation fitnatul ahlasi fiha harbun wa harbun in it is war and flight so the the timeline is taken from the hadith of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the actual timeline wa fitnatu sarra'i the second fitna is mentioned يَخْرُجُ دَخَنُهَا مِنْ تَحْتِ قَدَمِي رَجُلٍ يَزْعُمُ أَنَّهُ مِنِّي وَلَيْسَ مِنِّي That the second fitna, second tribulation, its smoke, دَخَن, shall come out from underneath the feet of a man who shall claim to be from me, meaning from the prophetic household. إِنَّمَا أَوْلِيَاءِ الْمُتَّقُونَ That my awliya, meaning my uh, uh, kinship is with whom? المتقون, those who fear, or we would say those who are weary, God weary, uh, mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this tells us fitna to sarra shall, shall occur from underneath the feet of a man who claims to be from the prophetic lineage after fitnatul ahlas so fitnatul ahlas shall occur 
Then fitnatu sarra, a tribulation that occurs, the smoke of which occurs from a man who cl- claims to be from the prophetic household. This fitnatu sarra, if we observe the timeline from the dismantling of the khilafa, the breakup of the khilafa, we'll notice that a Sharif al Hussein, who was the Amir of Makkah al Mukarramah, the governor of Makkah al Mukarramah, he was treacherous to the caliphate. And because of him and many other Arab nationalists, the caliphate is, itself was divided into segments. So the colonialists at the time, they divided the, the various Muslim countries, the borders that we have today. If you observe some of the borders, they are straight like a ruler line because they were literally drawn up with a ruler. So the colonialists, they segmented the Muslim world, but this fitna is referred to as fitna to sarra. And it started under the feet of a man who shall claim to be from the prophetic household, which without doubt is a Sharif al Hussein. And others have claimed it is Saddam Hussein from the Gulf War. But really, uh, the fitna, fitna to ahlas which involved harb and harb, fighting and running away, and tada'i al umam, the nations converging on the Muslims, and the Muslims running away in war, and losing territory to the non Muslims, and then the splitting of the Khilafah shows that fitna to sarra started in this period. So, describing this period of tribulation, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ثُمَّ يُسْتَلِحُ النَّاسُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ then people shall make alliances ala rajulin meaning upon weak alliances ala rajulin with a man meaning it could be any man weak alliances people shall make thumma takunu fitnatu duhami then shall come the third fitna ad duham so this is why uh, the uh, name of the fitna is ad duhaima now what is the Description of this tribulation, which is referred to as ad duhayma So we have two periods, fitnatul ahlas, then after fitnatul ahlas was fitnatul sarra, then the third one, which is described as a duham or a duhayma This is a fitna, a tribulation, which refers to the infighting amongst the Muslims. The infighting that occurs from one nation to another. How is it described in the, in the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? لَا يَبْقَى بَيْتٌ مِّنَ الْعَرَبِ إِلَّا دَخَلَتْهُ There shall not be any Arab house except the tribulation has entered that house. And in another hadith, يُقَاتِلُ الرَّجُلُ فِيهَا لَا يَدْرِ عَلَى حَقٍ يُقَاتِلُ أَمْ عَلَى بَاطِلٍ a man will fight to kill in that tribulation. He will not even know whether he is upon the truth or upon falsehood. This is the, the fitna described as fitna to duhayma. Meaning, uh, in one hadith, the, they asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do these people, will they have minds? Will they have their intellect when they kill one another? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, La, no. Tunza'u uqulu akthari ahli thalika zaman. That the intellects of majority of the people of that time will be removed from them. Wa yakhlufu lahu haba'u min al-nasi la uqula lahum. That shall remain haba' a dust of people that shall have no intellects. Meaning, they will not utilize the intellect which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. So this is the third tribulation, uh, which is referred to as ad duhayma Now, during these periods of 100 years, we observe what occurred in the Muslim world. Firstly, you had the forceful abdication of a Sultan Abdul Hamid Thani Rahmallahu Ta'ala in 1908 to 1909. 
after which the Young Turk movement was governing Turkey and, and the, the caliphate, the, the territories of the Khilafa. The last legitimate Khalifa really was a Sultan Abdul Hamid II. In that period of time, you had the Zionist movement attempting to buy Palestine from a Sultan Abdul Hamid Thani. The famous statement that he shall never sell the land because the land was never purchased by him, but was a land which was taken by his ancestors through the shedding of blood. Meaning ancestors here doesn't refer to Turks. It refers to Muslim ancestors. Additional to that, meaning the finding of the Zionist movement, something which I mentioned regarding the method of interpretation. Now there is a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa where he mentions narun yahshurun nas. There shall be a fire in the end of times that shall assemble the people. A new method of interpreting this, which I read in the, in the edition of this work, Iqtu durar fi akhbar al-muntadhar, one of the most comprehensive works on, on al-Imam al-Mahdi, the editor of the work, he mentions in the beginning that narun yahshurun nas refers to in Surah Al-Hashr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned a hashr for the Jews, a an assembling of the Jews. And Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma would say to people, do not term this chapter Surah Al-Hashr, term it Surah Al-Nadir, in reference to Banu Al-Nadir, the Jews. But why would Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma do this? Because so people do not confuse that hashar with the, the hashar of the Day of Judgment. Two different hashars. Meaning there is one assembling of the Jews that shall occur before the end of times in the Holy Land. And then there is the assembling on the Day of Judgment. So the hashar that is mentioned in Surah Al-Hashar refers to the assembling of the Jews in the Holy Land in the end of times. So a hadith states... Narun yahshurun nas, a fire shall assemble the people. Generally, the scholars of Islam interpreted all those hadith as referring to a fire that shall appear uh, on the day of judgment that shall gather the people onto the land of the resurrection. But some of those narrations mention that some people shall sit, ten people shall sit on a ride and they shall be assembled, more than 10 people shall be assembled on a ride, etc. And the fire shall stop wherever they stop. So scholars even mention, this means a fire shall be, a ring of fire shall be around them and it shall force them to go to the day, day of judgment. This is how they interpreted this. But a novel interpretation, which really doesn't contradict the methodology that I was mentioning earlier, is that the fire refers to the combustion engine. That the engine that we have in cars and aeroplanes and steamships, all of these engines burn on what? On fire. That fire has literally gathered the Jews today in the Holy Land. And when was the, the car invented? Around the same time when the Zionist movement was founded. You have the invention of the steamships and the the anything that works on fire on the combustion engine that the fire burns and it literally gathered the jews in the land assembled them in the land the holy land this is what has occurred the airplanes transport them to the holy land the cars take them to the holy land likewise the steamships take them to the holy land whatever that may be this is an example of how some people are interpreting the signs of the end of times. This particular interpretation does not contradict the mainstream interpretation because the hadith of Hashar, the resurrection and the end of times, meaning on the day of judgment, is in reference to the dead when they will be resurrected and transported 
to the land of the resurrection, uh, to the land of the Day of Judgment. But it makes sense to say today that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created and facilitated the means by which the Jews have assembled today in the land of Israel. Now that they have assembled in the land of Israel, this occurred around the same time when the Khilafah was dismantled and Fitnatul Ahlas occurred, then Fitnatul Sarra, then after Fitnatul Sarra, Fitnatul Duhayma, and after Fitnatul Duhayma, the fit, uh, Fitnatul Umya. What is Fitnatul Umya? Fitnatul Umya is the blind is the blind fitna. Now, from the early 1900s, you've had the congregating of the Jews in the Holy Land and the forceful taking of Palestine, the dismantling of the Khilafah, the doing away of the gold and silver currency, the correct currency, the doing away of that in the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944 and then in 1971 and the doing away of uh, real currency. After this, you also have the formation of the United Nations and as, uh, in Arabic, as I mentioned, referred to as Al-Umam Al-Muttahida, the United Nations, even though five nations can veto 180 nations. So you have five nations China, Russia, Britain, America, and, Fra uh, and France, these five nations, they can veto any other nation, meaning 180 nations. Like the, the UK has up, upper chamber and lower chamber, the UN also has this, and this is called a dem democratic system. Nevertheless, the formation of the United Nations, likewise the World Bank, likewise the IMF, were these things foretold by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The answer is yes. I will go on to the currency and the economic state of the world uh, towards the end. But fit, all these tribulations were referred to by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Fitnatul Ahlasi, Fitnatul Sarra, Fitnatul Duhayma. After this, a fourth tribulation shall occur. What is interesting about the fourth tribulation is what occurs after the fourth tribulation. And where are, where are we currently located in this timeline? We are located in the fourth tribulation. So people who are unclear where we stand today, uh, as will become clear when we read the hadith, we are currently located in the fourth tribulation. The hadith states, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said تَأْتِيكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ shall come to you after me أَرْبَعُ فِتَنٍ four tribulations so note here this uh, division into four is not done by me it's done by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam four tribulations فَالرَّابِعَةُ مِنْهَا الصَّمَّاءُ الْعُمْيَاءُ the fourth one is the deaf and dumb Deaf and blind tribulation. Al Mutbiqa Ta'ruku al Ummatu fiha bil balai arka al adim. Meaning, the people shall be have intense tribulation in this fourth tribulation. Hatta yunkara fiha al ma'aruf wa yu'arafu fiha al munkaru. Until people reject the good things. And will accept the bad things. Their hearts will die like the way the bodies die. Meaning this is a spiritual tribulation also. That the heart shall die in the way the physical body dies. In another hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said regarding this fourth tribulation. لا ينجو من شرها. No one is saved from its evil. إلا من دعا كدعاء الغريق أو كدعاء الغرقي. Except like the one drowning. Meaning pure supplication to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. 
As'adu ahliha, the most happy people in this fourth trib tribulation. Kullu taqiyin khafiyin, every pious person, taqi, pious person who is hidden. Iza zahara lam yu'raf, if he appears, no one knows him. Wa in jalasa lam yuftaqad, if he doesn't appear, he is not missed. Wa ashqa ahliha, kullu khatibin misqa'in, aw rakibi mawdi'in, and the worst people in that tribulation are the ones who speak in the tribulation, increasing the tribulation, or who ride in the tribulation. This is referring to Al-Fitnatul Rabi'ah, the fourth tribulation. Additional to this, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describing the fourth fitna, fourth tribulation said, Al-Fitnatul Rabi'atu Umya, it's a blind tribulation, Muzlima, dark, Tamuru Mawj al Bahri, like the waves of the sea. La Yabqa Baytun min al Arabi wal Ajami, illa malaatu, dhulan wa khofan. There shall not remain any Arab and non Arab home. This makes a distinction between this and the third tribulation. The third tribulation mentioned the Arab home. This mentions Arab and non Arab home. Illa malaatu, dhulan wa khofan, except the tribulation shall disgrace them. And make them fearful. Tutifu bishami. It shall go around Syria. This tribulation. Wa taqsha bil Iraqi. And it shall go into Iraq. Wa taqbutu bil jazirati bi yadiya wa rijliya. Its hand and its leg shall enter the Arabian Peninsula. So likewise this tribulation is described. Again. Hatta yunkara fiha al ma'roof. The good things will be rejected. That the bad things will be accepted. No one will be able to <coughs> remove themselves from this tribulation. Whenever it appears in one part of the world, or when it disappears from one part of the world, from one part, it shall reappear in another part. So the hadith states, They will not patch it up in one area, except it will reappear in another area. Meaning you may make peace in one region, but then it erupts again in another region. What will happen in this tribulation? يُصْبِحُ الرَّجُلُ فِيهَا مُؤْمِنًا A man will wake up as a believer. وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا He shall go in the evening, he shall be a disbeliever. وَلَا يَنْجُو مِنْهَا إِلَّا مَنْ دَعَى كَدُعَاءِ الْغَرْقِ And no one will be saved from it except the one who supplicates like the one drowning في البحر in the sea. This tribulation, when shall it end? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa states, Tadumu ithnay ashara aman. It shall last 12 years. Tanjali hina tanjali. When it uncovers, when it finishes, Waqad in hasaratil furatu min an jabalim min zahab. That is when the Euphrates River shall uncover a mountain of gold. Fayaqtatiluna alayha. And they shall fight one another for that gold. From every nine, seven people shall be killed. Now this tribulation, uh, the fourth tribulation, in one hadith, it states 12 years, in another hadith, 18 years. That the tribulation shall last 18 years. But when it finishes, the Euphrates River will uncover itself. Uh, uh, uncover a mountain of, mountain of gold. So the, the water level of the Euphrates River shall diminish and a mountain of gold shall appear. This is Al-Fitnatul Rabi'atu, the fourth tribulation, which is referred to as Al-Umiya, the blind tribulation. In one version of the hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Fitna, Al-Fitnatul Arba'un, the tribulations are four. Fitna to Sarra, Waddarra, 
Then he mentioned the gold. The gold. And he said, This is from Sayyiduna Ali. رضي الله عنه. He said that these are the tribulations and then at the end a man from the offspring of the Prophet sallallahu shall appear. Meaning Imam al-Mahdi رضي الله عنه. Now, if we are in the fourth tribulation, which I believe we are, this fourth tribulation that we are in is described as a tribulation that affects everyone, meaning we look at the description. It affects everyone, Arab and non-Arab. It enters every home. It's a tribulation that affects Syria. It's a tribulation that affects Iraq. These two countries are mentioned, and then the Arabian Peninsula. If we observe the world after 9-11, those of you too young, meaning anyone, Uh, under the age of 25 or even under the age of 30 maybe too young to remember how the world was before 9-11 you will observe that the landscape of Islam was affected the most so after 9-11 the Muslim world was affected heavily that what we observe today in Iraq meaning the formation of groups like ISIS or the killing that is going on is directly linked to the events of 9-11. But also, we observe the rising growth of atheism in the world. That in the Arabian Peninsula and throughout Muslim majority countries, we observe that there is a rise of atheism, that someone in the morning will be a believer, in the evening he will be a disbeliever. Then we have the so-called Arab Spring and the fighting that occurred in the Arab Spring. This fitna, this tribulation is really fitna to umya the blind tribulation that is occurring. But what will occur after this blind tribulation finishes? The drying of the Euphrates River. Now, in previous seminars, uh, we covered in depth the uh, drying Euphrates and the water levels diminishing. So as believers now, we should uh, realize at what stage we are in. We are in the stage before these major signs of Imam al-Mahdi start occurring, but something else. That is the major war that shall occur, not Malhama, not Al-Malhama al-Kubra. Because Al-Malhamat Al-Kubra is, is the war that shall occur in the time of Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. The war that shall occur before Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, which will be referred to by the world as World War III, shall be a war for two resources. One resource is water. People shall fight for water. Drinking water is becoming scarce in the world sanitized water is hard to find in many parts of the world. If you look at the occupation of Palestine, the the Israelis, what they do is they find any watering place and they occupy it. Wherever there is a watering source, they will occupy it. Why? Because the next war will be for water and the second resource is gold. So from now, meaning as Muslims, what we should be aware of is that the period of time we live in is a period of tribulation. What tribulation? Blind violence, mindless violence. A Muslim should not involve himself in blind and mindless violence. The second is ignorance of religion that a person can fall into disbelief, kufr. But what will occur after this tribulation is a war a tremendous war that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said from every 100 people 99 people shall die this is a war prior to Al-Imam Al-Mahdi this shall increase the tribulation meaning the tribulation from our time will not decrease 
Al-Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anhu, his time shall not occur until certain signs have occurred and those signs are tribulations and wars. So the time period that we live in now is a period that a person must be al-qabidu ala dini al-qabidu ala jamar The one who grasps onto his religion is like the one grasping onto a hot coal. At one point, they met, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned regarding the eastern tribulations, meaning the tribulations that come from the east. The companions interjected and they said, what about the western tribulations? The tribulations that come from the west. This hadith The wording of the hadith is he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tilka a'zamu wa a'zamu and in the wording of Nu'aym bin Hamad tilka a'zamu wa atammu <clears throat> that tribulation is greater western tribulation <clears throat> what is western tribulation so you have eastern tribulation <coughs> which is tribulation of groups like the Khawarij with their mindless violence against Muslims. Eastern tribulation would be <clears throat> the current president of India, Modi, an Eastern tribulation, the Chinese government, an Eastern tribulation, likewise many tribulations from the East. But the Western tribulation is what was referred to as Tada'i, the calling of the nations, the weakening, economic weakening of the Muslim world, as well as the ideological, the ideological attack from the West also, which is different philosophical views which can affect the mind of uh, many Muslims, meaning different misguiding philosophies that come from the West. But the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa warned regarding both the East and the West, at this point, I'm going to uh, divert the subject slightly and then go back to Al-Imam al-Mahdi and prior to Al-Imam al-Mahdi, the Sufyani. And then after that, we will have the first questions and answers. And then after that, we shall have the presentation on Ya'juj and Ma'juj, a video also of the barrier. And... Then we will open up for the last questions and answers. So that's inshallah the idea. What I wanted to divert to is the, the theory of some of the people who claim to be scholars of eschatology. That they say the Euphrates river drying and a gold appearing has already occurred. When did it occur? When gold currency was done away with. And when the dollar which was backed by gold was done away with. So from the years 1944, the Bretton Woods Agreement uh, and 1971, common knowledge, if you read up on economy, they say this was the sign of the gold, the Euphrates gold. And this person reinterprets all the ahadith to say that the, the gold uh, referred to of the Euphrates River I mean, was the petrodollars that we have today, the paper money, which is uh, daylight robbery. Now, while in agreement that the petrodollars are a daylight robbery, the interpretation of that hadith is incorrect. It's a misinterpretation. Why? Because there are other hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which tell us regarding the plight of Muslims in the end of times, when the gold dirham and the gold, uh, the gold uh, dir dinar and the silver dirham will be done away with. They will be done away with in the end of times. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this in explicit hadith. So there is no need to forcefully reinterpret the hadith of the Euphrates River. I'll read out some of those hadith to you. Uh, for instance, in one hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said لَا يَأْتِيَنَّ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ لَا يَنْفَعُ فِيهِ إِلَّا دِينَارُ وَدِرْهَمُ 
a time shall come in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. A time shall come upon people that where the dirham and the dinar will not benefit them, meaning they'll have no benefit from the dirham and the dinar. This tells us of our time where it is illegal, it is prohibited for anyone to do transactions in gold and silver by international law. You cannot deal in gold and silver. So the hadith has foretold this. Likewise, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا كَانَ آخِرُ الزَّمَانِ لَا بُدَّ لِلنَّاسِ فِيهَا مِنَ الدَّرَاهِمُ وَدَنَانِيرِ When the end of times occur, it will be essential for people to have silver and gold coins. But يُقِيمُ الرَّجْلُ بِهَا دِينَهُ وَدُنْيَاهُ By which a man can make his worldly life and his religious life safe. Establish his worldly and religious life. Showing that gold and silver will be rare. Likewise, Sayyiduna Abu Huraira radiallahu an informed them, meaning the people at the time, that the dirham and the dinar would be unavailable in the end of times. And the people were shocked. He informed them, he said, the dirham and the dinar would be unavailable. Likewise, there are numerous other hadith telling us that the world economy will be affected that people will not have dirham and dinar. So this person does not need to go and reinterpret the hadith of the Euphrates because the hadith of the Euphrates is, is referring to the fourth fitna, al-fitna to rabia that once the fourth fitna finishes, the water levels shall diminish and, sol- and go- people will find gold underneath. Now why, when they find gold underneath, they, it will cause a war. Why will it cause a war? Because gold is now a rare commodity that governments want. So this will cause the third world war and the third world war will also be after resources like water. So water and gold will will cause the third world war. After this third world war will be the time just prior to the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anhu. So uh, this person, he, he mixes up the timeline also regarding Al-Malhamatul Kubra. Al-Malhamatul Kubra is the war that shall occur in the time of Al-Mahdi. It's not the war that occurs prior to Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. So some things after Fitnatul Duhayma and after Fitnatul Umya, a war shall occur. Meaning in this period of time that we are living in, some people may say, okay, you are waiting for a war. Some people will sit and wait for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, no war occurs. How do we respond to this? How we respond to this, what is not important to us is the period of time. It's identifying what period you live in. Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told a companion known as Al-Miqdam radiallahu an that save your gold and silver because this is a long period of time. This is a long period of time. Meaning, how long it will last we do not know. It's ghayb, it's knowledge of the unseen known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I say now we are in the fourth tribulation, war will occur, a person waits for war 5 years, 10 years, 20 years and no war occurs, does it mean he doesn't prepare? The answer is no. He, he prepares to safeguard himself and his family from the tribulation, irrelevant to when it occurs. But the fourth period of time is just the period before the war that will be fought over for the gold and for water. Because in one hadith, it states Yanzul Ma'u Nazwa that the water shall go back into its into the ground. There'll be very few water water sources available in the Muslim majority countries. This is why Asham, Syria, is identified that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa gave guarantee regarding the water of Damascus. That Damascus will have water and Muslims should congregate in Damascus. So after this war, meaning the war for the gold, it does not entail the entire world is affected. 
what we know is that that region is affected. When I read the hadith on Al Imam Al Mahdi, radiallahu an, that Al Imam Al Mahdi, radiallahu an, will travel from Mecca, will go from Mecca al Mukarramah to Al Madinah to Al Munawwara, then back to Mecca, then back to Al Madinah to Al Munawwara, all within this period of a few days. Some of the scholars attempted to comment on this. They said, this occurs because he is from Ashab al Khutuwat, those pious people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breaks the norm for, the, breaks the laws of nature and they can travel very quickly. But today when we observe in the Arabian Peninsula, they have made the electric train which travels from Mecca al mukarramah to al Madinah to Al-Munawara. It makes sense that certain infrastructure of the, the Muslim world will not be affected within the next few decades. So the infrastructure of the Arabian Peninsula may not be affected, but nevertheless a war will occur. Where shall this war occur? This war shall occur on the borders of Iraq and Syria. In one hadith, it mentions very clear in the, in the fitan of Nu'aym bin Hamad that the, the gold shall be discovered on the, the Euphrates gold on the borders of Iraq and Syria. And that is where the major war shall occur. And it shall affect all nations. After this major war, when that entire region is in disarray, meaning the region that will be affected definitely is occupied Palestine, greater Syria, which includes Lebanon and Jordan, Iraq, Iran, and Central Asia. These areas will definitely be affected by this war. <coughs> Why? Because a new power will arise at that time. A power that shall rule for one year. That power, meaning I use the word power uh, in a limited human sense, that power, rising power, shall be, is referred to in some of the ahadith as a Sufyani. A Sufyani, a ruler that appears in that region that commits acts of oppression. So he, his rise shall not occur until this war. That war will not occur until this fourth tribulation is over. Once this tri fourth tribulation is over, a war will occur. Once the war occurs, a ruler referred to as a Sufyani shall appear. A Sufyani shall rule for one year in that region. When he rules for one year, after that the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anhu occurs. Then from the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anhu, and prior to his appearance, we know there will be a few signs like the tremendous earthquakes. The earthquakes will increase. In one hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa tells that the Khilafah shall descend in Al-Quds al-Sharif. And when it descends into Al-Quds al-Sharif, the, the earthquakes shall increase. So this Sufyani now, a few hadith relating to the Sufyani. One hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تزال طائفة And this is a very interesting hadith because it tells us who are the Ahlul Haq, the people of truth. لا تزال طائفة من أمتي A group of people shall never cease. يقاتلون Fighting in the way of Allah. Who are these people? على باب بيت المقدس وما حولها the people of Baytul Maqdis and the doors of Baytul Maqdis and the surrounding region, meaning the Palestinian people. That these young Palestinians, when they throw stones at the tanks and they fight for the, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the one young Palestinian I met in Al Quds al Sharif, he showed me his stomach with a bullet mark and said, I received this bullet defending the masjid. Al Masjid al Aqsa. These are the real people of Islam. Meaning, 
Uh, some people, unfortunately, if I go and debate a Wahhabi, they refer to this as jihad, or uh, if you go out and debate a Shia, it is a minor jihad in the sense you are defending the truthful creed. But the greater jihad is the jihad of the young children of Palestine who, who do not have weapons, but they surround the masjid, al-masjid al-Aqsa, and defend it from people who are known as the Israeli Defense Force, IDF, and these young children do not have guns or anything, and they will use their bodies physically to protect the masjid. These are mujahideen. Yes, the real mujahideen. So, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ta'ifatun min ummati yuqatiluna ala babi bayt al-maqdis. These people shall continue struggling on the doors of bayt al-maqdis wa ma hawlaha and the area surrounding it. So the, the people of Palestine. Uh, three more groups are mentioned. Wa ala babi intaqiya wa ma hawla. The, do, the surrounding areas of Antioch. And the, these were the areas defended during the Crusader period and still are defended, meaning against foreign aggression. A third group, وَعَلَىٰ أَبْوَابِ دَمِشْقْ وَمَا حَوْلَهَا the, sur- the people of Damascus and the surrounding areas of Damascus, meaning the scholars of Asham of Damascus specifically are mentioned. Fourth group. وَعَلَىٰ أَبْوَابِ الطَّالِقَانِ وَمَا حَوْلَهَا An area known as الطَّالِقَانِ Where is this? This is Central Asia. This is the region, uh, the people who, killed, uh, who kicked out the Soviets, the same people who resist NATO, the same people from whom the helpers of Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an shall descend. These four groups of people, ظَاهِرِينَ عَلَى الْحَقِّ They are apparent on the truth. لَا يَسْأَلُونَ مَنْ خَذَلَهُمْ They do not ask those who betray them. So today when the people of Gaza are alone, the Arab world has abandoned them, the UAE has abandoned them, the, the, the Saudi Arabian government has abandoned them. Different governments of that region have abandoned them. Some of the leaders are all talk. Yet they have trade deals with Israel. They will talk for Palestine, but they have trade deals with Israel. Yes. They are not affected. They, are, they do not even ask those who do not, uh, even those who uh, help them. They do not beg from them. Look at the people of Gaza. And the people surrounding Al Quds Sharif. Hatta Yukhriju Allahu Kanza Taliqan until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings out the treasure of a Taliqan, the Khurasan people. Fayuhi bihim dinahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall revive with them his religion, Kama Umita min Qabl, like it was made to die away prior. So this is referring to a group of people that shall rise. From Khurasan. Where is this hadith? This hadith is narrated in Fada'il al-Sham uh, and uh, uh, Ibn Asakir mentions it in Tariqh Damishq, in the history of Damascus. Authentic hadith mentioned the black banners appearing from Khurasan. These people are referred to as Kanzu Taliqan, the treasure of that region. Some people, unfortunately, they misinterpret these hadith. At one point, People who were a part of ISIS, they believe that the ISIS group is that group. But ISIS never planted a single flag in Palestine or in uh, Jerusalem. At other points, some people think it's the Pakistani army. When the Pakistani army is not located in Khurasan. Khurasan, this army shall be raised after the war of the Euphrates gold. So currently, there are people in Al-Taliqan who defend the religion of Islam. But after the war for the treasure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall raise a group from those people that shall form the black banners. How will those black banners be able to march from all the way in Khurasan 
to Palestine, when today we have the Iranian government on the way, you have the Iraq coalition uh, foreign uh, backed government, not really ruling Iraq, but placed in Iraq. Then you have Syria and Bashar al-Assad in Damascus and uh, rebel groups holding Idlib and other parts. And then you have the foreign occupation, you have the Jordanian royal family ruling Jordan, you have a Lebanese government, and you have the Israeli occupation of Palestine. That is the world map today. But when this group appears, all of that will be finished, that the group will be able to march from Al-Taliqan all the way up to occupied Palestine. How will the map have changed? Someone may ask, how did the map change? The map will change after Al-Fitrat Al-Rabi'ah is over, this current tribulation, and a war occurs. A war will occur in that region that all these governments will be finished and there will be mass killing. A ruler will rise who will, whose title is a Sufyani, not his name. And he will rule that region. The black banners will invade from the east, that, all these countries, and they will reach occupied Palestine. Now, the current occupation will be finished, meaning the is Israeli current occupation, before Ad-Dajjal. Because some people think at the Jal will they because what the Zionist theory is, they will occupy Jerusalem, make the temple, and then the Messiah will appear. But prior to that, the Muslims will destroy that plan. And what will happen? That will enrage at the Jal because in the hadith of Sayyidatuna Hafsa radiallahu anha, when Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma met. Ibn Sayyad in an alleyway, this is in Sahih Muslim. Ibn Sayyad, his eye had become disfigured. And Abdullah bin Umar was of the opinion, Ibn Sayyad is a Dajjal. So he said to him, what has happened to your eye? Ibn Sayyad said, I do not know. He said, your eye is in your head and you do not know. So Ibn Sayyad said, if Allah had wanted, Allah can place my eye in your stick. So Abdullah bin Umar beat him up with the stick. When he beat him up, Ibn Sayyad literally start growing in size. And Abdullah bin Umar ran away. He went into the house of Hafsa radiallahu anha. And she said, do not anger him. Because have you not heard that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the Dajjal will be angered when he appears. Something will anger him. Now it's a matter of speculation what will anger him. There are opinions of scholars. But the opinion that I have read, two opinions. One is the destruction of the modern occupation of Palestine. That will be destroyed at the hands of of the black banners of al taliqan of Khurasan and Al-Imam Al-Mahdi radiallahu an. And the second thing that will anger him is the conquering of two cities, Constantinople and Rome. Rome shall also be conquered by Al-Imam Al-Mahdi radiallahu an. It's, both cities are mentioned. In fact, Rome is referred to as Medina al kufri the city of disbelief. So prior to this, the Sufyani will emerge. So are we clear on the timeline? You have the four tribulations, then the current tribulation, which is Fitnatul Umya. After Fitnatul Umya, the war for the Euphrates gold. After the war for the Euphrates gold and water, the map of the world, the map of the Middle East, the map of the Middle East of that region shall change. When the map changes, the Sufyani sh shall appear. We do not know whether we will be alive at that time or not. But what we do know is we are in the precursor to the war, the time just before the war. So the description of the Sufyani is a Sufyani you. Kullu man asahu yanshuruhum bil manashir. 
وَيَطْبَخُهُمْ بِالْقُدُورِ سِتَّةَ أَشْهُرِ He shall cut people in half and boil them in cauldrons, meaning a tyrant. For six months he will be able to do this. Remember, the tribulation of Sufyani shall only last six months. In this work, Iqtu durar there are additional narrations. But there's something of interest which I wanted to mention, which is, and we will open up for questions and answers uh, shortly, is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned signs that will occur in the rule of Sufyani which are similar to nuclear attacks. In which hadith? In one hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, So we have all these uh, questions, inshallah, we'll go through every single one. Is Innahu Satabdu Ayatun Umudan min Narin A sign shall come like a column of fire. Yatlu'u min qibal al mashriq It shall appear from the east. This is during the rule of Sufyani. Now uh, let me go back to what I said to you in the beginning that some people are good at misinterpreting the Asharatu Sa'a. Do you remember that when the Olympic Games happened, someone sent this hadith out as a text message that the Olympic Games will have a nuclear attack and they used this hadith. But this again is using the incorrect methodology, not knowing when this sign shall occur. In the timeline, this sign occurs in the one-year rule of the Sufyani. It states, يَطْلُعُ مِنْ قِبَلِ الْمَشْرِقِ يَرَاهُ أَهْلُ الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ The people of the entire earth will be able to see it. A column of fire from the east. فَمَنْ أَدْرَكَ ذَلِكَ Whoever lives in that time. فَلْيُعِدَّ لِأَهْلِهِ طَعَامَ سَنَةٍ let him store away the food of one year. One year's food. And in another narration, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ عُمُودًا مِنْ نَارٍ مِنْ قِبَلِ الْمَشْرِقِ If you see the column of fire from the east, في شهر رمضان In the month of Ramadan, في السماء in the sky, فَأَعِدُّ مِنَ الطَّعَامِ Prepare مِنَ الطَّعَامِ From food مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ What you are able to do فَإِنَّ سَنَةَ جُوعُ It will be one year of starvation One year of starvation so in the rule of Sufyani, a fire shall appear. <coughs> now some of the scholars commenting on this, they state this is a natural sign. But today we know that nuclear weapons are proliferated, are available throughout the world. And a column of fire can only occur with a nuclear weapon. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed us that when this occurs, store one year amount of food. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi alhamd al-shakirin wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een as I mentioned, I will be covering some of the aspects of the rule of Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an. Then we will proceed to the subject of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anhu, his appearance shall occur after all these events that we covered, which was 
the four fitan, four tribulations, after al fitna to Rabi'ah, the fourth tribulation, shall be the drying of the Euphrates, the uncovering of the gold, the war, the impending war, which we may term as World War Three, the reforming of the map of the Near East, especially of greater Syria, Iraq, Iran and Central Asia, the appearance of the black banners. Now this, uh, these are some of the signs of the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi. Some of the authentic signs we covered in a previous seminar, like the shouting out of a voice which people will hear, as mentioned in the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, the earthquake in Harasta in Syria, uh, the effects of which will be so intense that the western part of the Grand Umayyad Masjid shall fall down. But just to mention a few hadith which are very relevant, one is that Sayyiduna, Abu uh, uh, Sayyiduna Ibn Hawala al-Azdi radiallahu anhu, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, Yabna Hawalata, O son of Hawala, Iza ra'ayta al-khilafata qad nazalati al-ard al-muqaddasata. When you see that the khilafa has descended into the purified land, meaning Jerusalem, Iza ra'ayta al-khilafata qad nazalati al-ard al-muqaddasata. When you see the Khilafa descend in the pure land, meaning Jerusalem, فَقَدْ الزَّلَازِلُ وَالْبَلَابِلُ uh, The earthquakes have approached at that time. وَالْبَلَابِلُ Balabil is plural of Balbala, meaning tribulations. وَالْأُمُورُ الْعِظَامُ And major matters. Umur, plural of Amr, عِظَام, tremendous matters. وَالسَّاعَةُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ أَقْرَبُ مِنَ النَّاسِ مِنْ يَدِ هَذِهِ مِنْ رَأْسِكَ The Prophet had his hand on Ibn Hawala's head and said, the hour is more closer at that time than my hand is to your head. So this hadith, generally when people read this, they think this refers to when Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu conquered Jerusalem. But that is in a different hadith. That is in the hadith, U'udud bayna yadayi sa'ati sittan. Count from the, between, before the hour, six things will happen. And one of them is the conquering of Jerusalem. That's in the caliphate of Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu an. But this one is in reference to the conquering of Al-Quds al-Sharif again. In the end of times when the Khilafah shall descend into Al-Quds, what is the distinction? The distinction is that Al-Quds Sharif was conquered in previous times in the time of Salahuddin al-Ayubi radiallahu an. But he was not a Khalifa. The Caliph was in Baghdad. Sayyiduna Salahuddin rahimahullah ta'ala paid an oath of allegiance to the Caliph in Baghdad. Because one of the conditions of the Khalifa is that he be Qurayshi. Some scholars, they said that the Ottomans were not Qurayshi. And therefore, they are valid sultans and not Khulafa. But uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Ghani al-Nablusi, rahimullah ta'ala, he produced a lineage for them that Urtughul, and his father, Suleiman Shah, descended from Quraysh. They were not actually Turks. So this was a, a, an opinion held by scholars like Sheikh Abdul Ghani and Nablusi, rahimahullah ta'ala. By ijma of Ahl Sunnah, consensus of Ahl Sunnah, the Khalifa must be Qurayshi. This is a point of consensus among Sunni ulama, uh, the scholars of the four schools. But uh, some of them did, were unaware that the Ottomans were from Qurayshi lineage. A Sheikh Abdul Ghani and Nablusi rahimahullah ta'ala held the view that they were of Qurayshi lineage. Nevertheless, 
when Salahuddin Aliyubi rahimallah conquered Al Quds al Sharif, this does not fulfill this particular, that event does not fulfill this particular prophecy. Because this prophecy states the Khalif, the Khilafa shall descend, Khilafa Caliphate. That means the Caliphate shall move from Al Madina to Al Munawwara, which it did, it went to Al Kufa. Then from Al Kufa to Damascus. Then from Damascus to Baghdad. Then from Baghdad to Istanbul. Uh, or Istanbul. Or Constantinople. Then from Istanbul, the caliphate was demolished or dismantled. But then the caliphate shall descend in Al Quds Sharif when the black banners appear in that time. When that happens, earthquakes will increase. Now, this makes sense. Why? Because the other hadith states that an earthquake shall occur in Harasta in Syria, so tremendous that the western wall of the Grand Umayyad Masjid shall fall down. Nu'aym bin Hamad mentions this hadith in Al-Fitr. So this, the timeline all fits in like a jigsaw puzzle, meaning if someone reads all the works of hadith and the works of the scholars, they will realize that all of this fits in a, in a timeline, meaning the scholars uh, did good khidma service in where they commented on these things and even contemporary scholars who, who have collated all the hadith and given a timeline. Additional to this, a famous hadith. This hadith, uh, many of you must have heard in the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Umranu Baytil Maqdis Kharabu Yathrib Wa Kharabu Yathrib Khurujul Malhama Wa Khurujul Malhama Fathul Qustun Tinya وَفَتْحُ الْقُسْطُنْطِنِيَةِ خُرُوجُ الدَّجَّالِ The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Umranu Baytul Maqdis The building up of Baytul Maqdis of Jerusalem as a city will lead to the destruction of Yathrib The word Yathrib is used The destruction of Yathrib shall lead to the Malhama. This is a timeline. The Malhama shall lead to the conquering of Constantinople. The conquering of Constantinople shall lead to the exiting of a Dajjal, meaning appearance of a Dajjal. So here, the Kharabu Bayt al-Maqdis has, uh, the Umranu Bayt al-Maqdis has occurred in our lifetimes. How has it occurred? If you check a Sayyid Sharif al Jurjani's ta'liq note on this, he says, Bistila il Kufari alayha, that Umranu Bayt al Maqdis will happen, that the disbelievers shall take over Baytul Maqdis. <clears throat> if you go to Jerusalem today, you will observe that the Jews, the Zionists, have developed parts of the city in a beautiful manner even though they attempt to get rid of Muslim history, but the city is restored, the old gates of the city, everything old is restored. Everything old is restored. Then, Kharabu Yathrib, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say destruction of Al-Madina. He said Yathrib, the old name. Why is this? Remember, Al-Madina to al will be abandoned twice. Once during Malhama and a second time when all the Muslims shall die on the face of the earth and the city will be deserted and will go back to being a date tree farm, a, 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 a plant grow a, a, like a, a park of trees, meaning back to its natural beauty. This is uh, some of the scholars attempted to interpret this in accordance with that, but what did I mention about correct methodology? When the sign occurs, you shall know. That sign has also occurred. With Saudi rule of al madinah al munawwarah they have destroyed all the old signs of the city of Yathrib. So all the old signs of the city of Yathrib, the time before the Prophet wasallam, those things are being destroyed. So we are observing these two things. 
Umran Ubayt al Maqdis, the building up of the city of Jerusalem. But at the same time, Kharabu Yathrib, the destruction of the pre Al Madina Tul Manawara Yathrib. Then the timeline tells us Khurujul Malhama will occur. It doesn't tell us about the, the gap of years, but it does tell us that the Malhama shall occur after. This means between the drying of the Euphrates River and the appearance of Sufyani and the reconquering of Baytul Maqdis, the reconquering of Baytul Maqdis and the Khilafa descending into Baytul Maqdis, an increase of earthquakes. After that, in the seventh year of Al-Mahdi's rule, shall, the Malhama shall occur. That is after the war for gold, after the war for water, after that, meaning many years away. But then, after the conquering of Constantinople, one thing is mentioned, Constantinople, but what is the distinction between the conquering of Muhammad al-Fatih and the conquering of Al-Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an is that Al-Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an shall also conquer the city of Rome. He shall conquer two cities. The city of Rome is referred to as Medina al-Kufri. Medina al-Kufr, the city of disbelief. So in the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Medina al-Kufri and Al-Qustuntinya, both cities shall be conquered by Al-Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an. So, if you listen to my lecture on Ghazwat al-Hind, Ghazwat al-Hind will occur in that period of time, also in the timeline. Al-Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an shall dispatch a group of people to Al-Hind at that period. But he shall also dispatch an army to Rome, the city of Rome. When they reach the city of Rome, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa told them regarding the location of the true Injil. In a hadith, the true Injil is located in the Vatican. So the army of Imam al-Mahdi shall conquer the Vatican, Rome and Constantinople. They shall also dismantle the state of Israel, the current occupation unless it's dismantled prior by Muslims, which is also a possibility. It is a possibility that Muslims can dismantle the state of Israel today, but irrelevant to whether Israel, the illegal occupation exists at that time or not, meaning Muslims should not be, uh, we are commanded to carry out our task that Irrelevant to whether it is dismantled or not, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi radiallahu an shall make Al-Quds Al-Sharif the center of the Khilafah. In some narrations, it is said Damascus shall be the, ca uh, the capital, but from the hadith here, it becomes clear that Qad Nazalat al Arda al muqaddasa refers to a conquering, a reconquering of Al-Quds Al-Sharif. So, how many cities shall he? Conquer numerous. Jablu Dalam is mentioned. Dalam is a region in Asia. He shall rule Jablu Dalam. He shall his his empire shall expand from Rome all the way up to India. Some people are under the impression that Al Imam Al Mahdi will rule the entire world. He will not rule the entire world. He will have an expanded country from Rome all the way up to India, and will establish. A strong economy because we know that he will give out gold to the people. Gold will be available in abundance at the time. Gold and silver. So at that time, uh, the fulfillment uh, in the time of Sayyiduna Isa salam is the fulfillment of where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَلَا يَبْقَى عَلَى ظَهْرِ الْأَرْضِ بَيْتُ مُدَرٍ وَلَا وَبْرٍ <laughs> that there shall not remain any house made from mud or made from wabar, which is the hide of animals, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall make Islam enter it. 
this shall occur in its complete form in the time of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So these were some of the uh, things I wanted to mention regarding Al-Imam Al-Mahdi radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the timeline that we are currently in. Going on to Ya'juj and Ma'juj, meaning the timeline up to the time of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam, we know that when Al-Imam al-Mahdi will conquer Constantinople and the city of Rome. Ad-Dajjal shall appear. Where shall he appear from? From the east. From the east. And then he will appear in various cities in the east. So uh, the, what is mentioned in the previous seminar, we covered the journey of a Dajjal across the cities. So he shall appear in like places like Asfahan. Then from Asfahan, take a journey with the 70,000 Jews that shall follow him, shall be from Asfahan wearing the shawls. Then the journey will go through Basra and Kufa and all these different cities until he appears in Asham. When he appears in Sham, that is when his global tour starts. Meaning like Donald Trump takes his aeroplane around the world, uh, presidential aeroplane, Air Force One, uh, Ad Dajjal, who will now be the new proclaimed president of the world, he shall, uh, he shall defeat the Muslims in what Al-Imam al-Mahdi had restored. And this is when Al-Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu an and the Muslims shall retreat. But what shall occur prior to that is years of famine also. Remember, uh, years, uh, three years of famine, where one third of the rain will be withheld, then two thirds, and then the, the entire world's rain shall be stopped for three years. So there will be poverty, apart from the regions where Muslims were ruling, where Al Imam al Mahdi was ruling, there shall be global poverty. But then when Ad Dajjal reconquers those regions for the non Muslims, for the Jews spe specifically, Poverty shall increase in those regions. Death shall increase. Killing shall increase. And then his claim to being God, he shall make his claim in every city. But the Muslims are advised not to go to him. If he enters your city, do not go to him, stay in your homes or run to the mountains. Of course, if people have smartphones at that time, they will attempt to watch him on, on the smartphone. Meaning the tribulation will be immense, but it will be, one point to note, it will be a post-apocalyptic world. Why will it be a post-apocalyptic world? This is why I believe at that time, technology will not be rife. Why? Because once the malhama has occurred, al-malhamatul kubra, the Muslim world will also be affected. So remember, the malhama will be so immense. You will have seven years of prosperity, but the malhama will be so immense between Al-Imam al-Mahdi and the forces, uh, the European forces, that thousands will die. One third of the army of Al-Imam al-Mahdi will, will run away. One third will be martyred. And one third will receive victory. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, What shall they be happy regard, meaning the, the victory, shall not give them any happiness because many of them would have died. And the war booty that they have gained, even if it is distributed, many of them have died. So they will leave widows. And this is the meaning of the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that one of the signs of the, of the Day of Judgment is that there will be 50 women to one man. Now some people read this hadith with the flawed methodology and they, attry, they try applying the hadith today. So they make theories up. One theory was the mobile phone, it uh, does away with one of the chromosomes. You have the X chromosome and the Y chromosome and therefore the men will give birth to more girls than boys. 
and this is the meaning of the hadith. I mean, this is takalluf, takalluf in interpreting the hadith. The correct meaning of the hadith is after al malhamatul kubra, so many deaths would have occurred in that region that each male would have 50 women to look after. Qayyimun wahidun, meaning one uh, caretaker for 50 women, daughters, nieces, uh, different women related to that one individual. It's an occurrence that shall happen then in that specific region. That sign has not occurred. It will occur after al malhamatul kubra. This is why it's important knowing the timeline. So when a Dajjal, the individual appears, we know regarding the descent of Isa alayhi salam. And remember, at that time, the people with Al-Imam al-Mahdi radiallahu anhu will only uh, number a few hundred. Will only number a few hundred, meaning it's very unlikely we will be alive to see that time. Very unlikely. The time, we have to understand the timeline we are living in. We are living in the, the pre-World War III time. If we survive World War III, then very few people will survive the time of the Sufyani. Not only because of the wars, but because of our lifespans, meaning it could be decades away. But what we do know is that currently we are in Al-Fitnatul Umya. So, after all these occurrences and Sayyiduna Isa Ali Salam descends, where on, on the eastern minaret in Damascus, when he descends at the eastern minaret in Damascus, which Mirza Ghulam Qadiani again distorted the hadith, meaning this is an old trick, saying he, he had a minaret constructed in India in Qadian. And he said, look, it's east of Damascus. The minaret is east of Damascus. If you, because if you draw a line from Damascus to India, it's east. But of course, the hadith means that there will be a white minaret in Damascus uh, at which Sayyiduna Isa a.s. will descend. Some have said it's the minaret in the Grand Umayyad Masjid, which is closed off today. It's the same minaret that Imam al-Ghazali wrote portions of his Ihya. Others in Damascus, scholars in Damascus, have said it's the minaret in Bab Tuma. Bab Tuma is a Christian district. There is a white minaret constructed by the Christians with a cross, a white cross. So it makes sense that Isa a.s. will descend there to guide the Christians and then destroy the cross. The Christians will follow him. What is also mentioned is that the Jews in Damascus at that time will also accept Islam at the hands of Isa a.s. Uh, likewise, uh, Al-Imam al-Mahdi will have converted many Jews to Islam. This is something not mentioned by people, that many of the Jews, uh, of course this could be referring to the Sephardic Jews, the real Jewish people, not the Khaza Jews, like Benjamin Netanyahu, who's Polish. I mean, he's Khaza. He's, these are Khaza Jews from Central Asia, from the Caucasus, and they migrated to Europe. They, have no, they are not Semitic people. Benjamin Netanyahu is not a Semitic individual. But they, they employ the term anti-Semitism, but many of them are not Semitic. Nevertheless, after all these events shall transpire and Isa a.s. will chase a Dajjal up to the gate of Lud and kill a Dajjal, the individual, Dajjal, the individual at Lud. To Lud today there is a, an actual gate to the city of Lud. In the time of the Prophet wasallam, Lud was a small village. There was no gate. But now there is a gate and the Israelis have an airport near Lud. But of course, uh, I believe Al Imam al Mahdi would have destroyed that airport or uh, Ad Dajjal will re establish another airport once he takes over that region. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. These are ghaybiyat that will only become apparent when they occur. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inform Isa alayhi salam that a group of people known as Ya'juj and Ma'juj have appeared. And this is the discussion now regarding Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Firstly, uh, there is a famous debate as to whether Western civilization is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I do not ascribe to this for various reasons. One is that Ya'juj and Ma'juj is described as, a, as, a, as an Eastern people that no one can defeat. Isa salam is told to go and take protection in the mountain of Atur. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down a bacteria or a worm and they are killed. But Western civilization falls under the period of Tada'i. Do you remember the period of Tada'i? Which was the period of Tada'i when the nations shall converge on the Muslims like eat, people who eat akala converge on a platter when they converge on a platter the nations are like this so the, the, the nations, the western nations whether they are the northern barbarians or whether it's the Khaza Jews or whether it's anyone else they are all a part of the nations of the world so this becomes difficult for people to comprehend because they say Ya'juj and Ma'juj exceed humanity in number. Where and how can a group so huge be hidden from our eyesight today when we live in the age of Google Maps, when we live in the age of satellites, when you can check from space as to the location of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So this is a, a small presentation with that regard. With the first thing, Let's identify Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Uh, firstly, they are from the offspring of Adam salam. They are human beings. And they are from the offspring of Yafith bin Nuh. Yafith bin Nuh. Meaning, Nuh salam had a child known as Yafith. And from him, uh, numerous nations, uh, he, he sired numerous sons who sired numerous nations. And Samura Tabni Jundubin, radiallahu anhu, qala qala rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith is narrated by Imam Ahmad and Al Imam Al Hakim. It's an authentic hadith. Waladu Nuhin Thalathatun. The children of Nuh had three. Sam, Ham and Yafith. So he had three children from whom numerous nations uh, came about. In another hadith, from both Samura, Samura radiallahu an and Imran radiallahu an, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Waladu Nuhin thalathatun. The offspring of Nuh had three. Fasam Abu al Arab. Sam is the father of the Arabs. Waham Abu al-Habasha. Ham is the father of Habasha, African people. Wayafith Abu al-Rum. Yafith is the father of al-Rum. This doesn't negate the other nations. One of them can give birth to more than one nation. These are just some of the nations being specified. Then Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, rahimullah, one of the most reliable scholars of Islam, he states that uh, according to the majority of the ulama, that the Ya'juj and Ma'juj tribes are offspring of Yafith. Now, Yafith, the races that uh, descend from Yafith, are races like the Turkic people and the Chinese people and all the races of the East, meaning even Indians. So the, the, the Indian subcontinent, the entire region, the Chinese, the Indonesians, Malaysians, the Turks and Ya'juj and Ma'juj. All of them are offspring of Yafith. This is with regard to Ya'juj and Ma'juj as human beings because some people 
they misunderstand the narrations and they think that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are jinn or monsters. Then we study some of the hadith. Now, in total, if you look for the hadith on Ya'juj and Ma'juj, you will find around 40 to 50 hadith, if not more, but they re revolve around one theme. One of those hadith is regarding the Day of Judgment, meaning Imam al-Bukhari mentions that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said on the Day of Judgment, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call out to Adam alayhi salam, Ya Adam, qum fab'ath ba'ath al-nar, take out the denizens of hell. And he will comply and ask, who are the people to go to hell? وَمَا بَعْثُ النَّارِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall say that from every thousand, nine hundred and ninety-nine. From every thousand, nine hundred and ninety-nine. And then the child's hair shall go grey. And if, a, if there was a woman pregnant, she would uh, miscarriage. And people will be intoxicated, but they are not, uh, lie as if they are sukara, as if they are drunk, but they will not be drunk. Meaning a description of the Day of Judgment from al Quranul Kareem. So, at this point, the companions became worried. How from every 1,999 will go to hell? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that Ya'juj and Ma'juj make up the 999 وَمِنْكُمْ wahid, and from you is one. This is one hadith. This is the hadith that makes it difficult for some people to comprehend that the number of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, if it is so huge and large, where are they today? They must be released. Meaning, you, you, the way they interpret it is you have one of two options. Either Ya'juj and Ma'juj are hidden away and we cannot comprehend how such a huge group is hidden away. The second scenario is that they were released in previous times and they make up some of the nations of the world today. Abdul Rahman al Sa'adi, who is the teacher of Salih al Uthaymin, he ascribed to the theory that all the nations of the world today are Ya'juj and Ma'juj except the Arabs and the Muslims. He was silenced by the Saudi authorities regarding this, by the king. But he wrote a book which was published posthumously on, on that subject. So, likewise, uh, another hadith with a similar meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall mention, take out, uh, uh, place the ba'athu nar, those who will be dispatched to hell. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be asked who are the ba'athu nar those who will be dispatched to hell the companions are told abshiru take glad tidings fa inna fi ya'juj wa ma'juj lakum fida that you have a fida in ya'juj and ma'juj fida meaning instead of you being sent ya'juj and ma'juj will be sent fa inna minkum rajulan wa min ya'juj wa ma'juj alf from you one man and from them 1000. So this again becomes difficult for people to comprehend. I will respond to how we answer the objections shortly. A third hadith which is narrated by Imam Tirmidhi rahimallahu ta'ala from Sayyiduna Imran bin Hussein radiallahu an that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said فَوَلَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ by the one who grasps my soul, innakum la ma'a khaliqatain, you are with two, cre two creations, ma kanata fi shay'in, they are not found in anything, illa kathratahu, except they exceeded, ya'juj wa ma'juj, wa man mata min bani Adam wa min bani Iblis, and whoever dies from this offspring of Adam alayhi salam, وَمِنْ بَنِي Iblis and the offspring of shaitan, Iblis, a jinn. This hadith clarifies the previous hadith. Likewise, the, uh, another hadith which may confuse people is إِنَّ يَأْجُوجَ وَمَأْجُوجَ مِنْ وَلَدِ آدَمِ 
that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are from the offspring of Adam alayhi salam. وَإِنَّهُمْ لَوْ أُرْسِلُوا إِلَى النَّاسِ لَأَفْسَدُوا عَلَيْهِمْ مَعَايِشَهُمْ If they are dispatched on people, they will destroy their livelihood. وَلَنْ يَمُوتَ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدٌ None of them die except إِلَّا تَرَكَ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِ أَلْفًا فَسَاعِدًا None of them die except that they leave 1,000 offspring. So this now is the objection that if they are so huge, where are they? They must be released. So, some people have ascribed to a theory that the Daryl Gorge <coughs> in Georgia or in the Caucasus, uh, a metal wall constructed by one of the Persian king kings, you read up on it, it was there, but then it was destroyed. When was it destroyed? They say during the time when the Khaza Jews, they weren't Jews at the time, the Turkic tribe known as the Khazar, they appeared. So when they appeared, the wall disappeared and they formed an empire in that region in, in cent near the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. In that region they formed an empire in the 600s. Around the time when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a dream and awoke and said, Ya'juj and Ma'juj have made a hole, hole in the wall. So they say, look, this was the first hole. The Ya'juj and Ma'juj escaped. And they destroyed the wall. Because in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, one companion came. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I saw the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. It's made from, it, its color is like stripes. There are stripes of red and black. So the wall existed in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's in Bukhari. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a dream that Ya'juj and, and the dreams of Prophets are true. That Ya'juj and Ma'juj have made a hole in the wall. A hole in the wall, meaning they, and this alluded to the, their escape. So when the Caliphs conquered different regions, they had to fight the Khaza Jews who were str a strong opponent and therefore these Khaza Jews, they are Ya'juj and Ma'juj because the Khulafa could not defeat them. This is the theory. Then when the, uh, the Khaza Jews disappeared and were finally defeated, they dispersed to Europe and their families settled in Europe, in Poland and other places. And from them, the modern day banking families like the Rothschilds and the others, they all descend from these Khaza Jews, which is factual. They do descend from the Khaza Jews. But the point of disagreement is these Khaza Jews, are they Ya'juj and Ma'juj? So to answer that, they say, if you believe Ya'juj and Ma'juj are still behind a barrier, you must answer these, these objections. That they numbers, their numbers exceed everyone. But the answer is simple to that that if they exceed the number of the companions and the number of the world, then at the time of their release, in that time, they should have exceeded the world's population, which they didn't. Meaning the Khaza Jews did not exceed the number of the world's population. So you are misunderstanding the Hadith. If you place all the Hadith together, you will understand that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, two things you will understand. One is, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he says they exceed your number, in one narration he only mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj. But in the other narration he mentions the rest of the offspring of Adam Alayhi Salam and the offspring of Iblis. So if you add the disbelievers from humankind, the disbelievers of jinn kind, of Iblis, the disbelievers of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they together make up 999 out of every thousand. Number one. Number two, if you read the hadith correctly, you will realize that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Minkum, meaning from amongst you. This means the companions or the Arabs. That if you add the population of the Arabs, the disbelievers will exceed the Arabs by 999 out of every thousand on the Day of Judgment. Or, 
The Ya'juj and Ma'juj in comparison to you companions are 999 out of every thousand. This is what I have understood from the Hadith. Even though some scholars do ascribe to the opinion that they exceed humanity, but this is not an, not an issue of ijma' consensus. So therefore, this is uh, the correct interpretation of the Hadith. Then the objection remains, if they do not exceed all of humanity, when they appear in the time of Isa a.s., why is he unable to defeat them? The response is, if you read the hadith correctly, all of the hadith, you will realize that Isa a.s. and his supporters in the time only number a few hundred. There is a clear hadith on this, numerous hadith. Because of the wars, the malhama, because of the malhama, and then the, the rule of a Dajjal, many of the believers would have died. Many of the people of the earth would have died because of the famines, the poverty, meaning there will be so much po poverty that a Dajjal will go to a group of people and say, you know, the, f the famous narrations like an Nawas bin Sam'an and others narrate that he will take advantage of people's poverty, giving them cows, filling the, uh, the udders of the, the cows uh, with milk, uh, reviving dead uh, camels, meaning poverty. Because of this, people will die, so the population will be less. So at that time, the, the number of Ya'juj and Ma'juj will exceed the Muslims excessively at that particular time. And when they reach Lake Tiberias, so an, a, an additional objection, that when Ya'juj and Ma'juj reach Lake Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee, the sea upon which Isa salam walked, the water will finish. Today the state of Israel is drinking the sea and the sea has gone beyond the stage of recovery. So they are saying the Khaza Jews, Benjamin Netanyahu and all these people, they are drinking the water from Lake Tiberias. This means they are Ya'juj and Ma'juj or the first dispatching of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The response to that is that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will drink the remaining water, whatever will remain up to that point. The water will not finish now. It will not finish now, it will finish at the time of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. How do we explain the Zionist hegemony or Zionist globalist agenda today without reference to Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Do we need to reference it to Ya'juj and Ma'juj? The answer is no. If you study the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Isra and Surah Bani Israel and Surah Al-Hashr and verses of Surah Al-Baqarah and verses from Surah Ali Imran, you will realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already mentioned the role of Bani Israel in the end of times without reference to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. But then two additional objections remain. One is, where is the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the second is in relation to the verse of Al-Quran Al-Kareem in Surah Al-Anbiya that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that any town that is destroyed haramun it is prohibited upon the people of that town to return it is prohibited on the people of that town to return until what? Hatta idha futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj. That until ya'juj and ma'juj have been opened, meaning their barrier has been opened. So, how the theory goes is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the people of a town, which is the Jews. And the town is Jerusalem. And when the people were banished from Jerusalem, they can never come back to the town until Ya'juj and Ma'juj are released. This is the theory. And the Jews have never been able to conquer, to invade Jerusalem until our present history. That 
means that the Jews have returned back to Jerusalem and it means that Ya'juj and Ma'juj have been released. Who are Ya'juj and Ma'juj? They are contained within Brit the British Empire, within the American Empire, within uh, the various empires or we within Western colonialism. I mean Ya'juj and Ma'juj are within them. It doesn't mean that the nations are Ya'juj and Ma'juj. It refers to the Khaza uh, Jews and others who are located within Western civilization who are Ya'juj and Ma'juj. But as I mentioned earlier that if you followed the lecture Tada'i, the Marhala to Tada'i, that the Umam, the nations are already mentioned in the Hadith. Who are the Umam? The, the Western nations specifically that colonized the Muslim world. There is no mention of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Likewise, the, the relationship between the Jews and the other nations is mentioned in other verses of the, uh, of the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran and other verses of the Quran. There is no mention of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. But the description of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is that they are mufsiduna fil ard. They should cause corruption on the earth. So what these people say is that this corruption that we observe in the world today is the corruption of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. When in reality that corruption is a different type that will occur once the barrier has been opened in the time of Isa alayhi salam. The corruption that we observe today has its roots in other things, in the multiple uh, groups that conspired to dismantle the Khilafah. If you read up on those groups, you will know where the roots of the current corruption is. But nevertheless, they say, okay, the reverse of the Quran says that any town, that a town, the town is specifically Jerusalem. Where is this verse? You can check it in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse 96 and 97. Verses 96 and 97. The response is very simple. And grammatically as well, their claim makes no sense in terms of Arabic grammar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Surah Al-Anbiya is, if you check the theme of Surah Al-Anbiya, it mentions the previous prophets and destroyed nations. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the towns that are destroyed, like in, in verse number 93, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning those towns that disobeyed the messengers, they were destroyed. Any one of those towns that was destroyed, it is not permitted for them to return on the Day of Judgment. Until what? Until the signs of the Day of Judgment occur, one of which, which is the opening of the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. That is the correct interpretation of the verse. Otherwise, Qariya, the word Qariya means a town, is without Al, a ta'rif, without Al. It's not Al Qariya, it's Qariya, it means any town. Throughout Al Quran Al Karim, it refers to towns in general, but the person says in response, Look at the story of Uzair salam in Surah Al Baqarah, O Kalladi Marra ala Qariyatin, O like the one who passed by a town. They say, Look, it's specific. What town was this? This was Jerusalem. Therefore, Qariyatin is specific in that verse. It's also specific in this verse. This is the response. But the response to that is, there is no agreement that that was Jerusalem. Read the story of Uzair alayhi salam. He's buried far from Jerusalem. He's not buried in Jerusalem. He, was, he passed by another town. The commentators mentioned that. Because Jerusalem is not specified, it may refer to any town. But they say no. It refers to Jerusalem and the return means the return of the Jewish people. So this dispute remains. Meaning, they say that the town was destroyed, meaning it was destroyed numerous times. Therefore, the Jews can never be returned to Jerusalem once they were expelled. Unless the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is open. And the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj uh, was uh, in the Daryl Gorge and is not currently there in, jo in Georgia and therefore the Ya'juj and Ma'juj have been released. The other opinion is 
Ya'juj and Ma'juj are still contained. And I've answered the objection that how can they be contained if they num exceed humanity? I've answered that objection. So, the story of Dhul Qarnayn is in Surah Al Kahf. I will not go into that today because I believe we'll expand the lecture ever so much if we go into the tafsir of Surah Al Kahf and also the tafsir of Surah Al Anbiya. But what the hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and others mentions is that the the tartib, the order is that khuruj al-dajjal, first the appearance of a dajjal then the descent of Isa alayhi salam and the killing of a dajjal then he said thumma yakhruju ya'juju wa ma'juj then ya'juj and ma'juj will appear meaning the companions mention this order and he says fayamujuna fil ardi at that time they shall fayamujun this is from the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when the barrier shall be broken they shall like uh, is like rolling of the waves they shall go into the earth like the waves why they will exceed humanity at that time at that particular time fayufsiduna fiha and they shall cause corruption in the earth and this is the meaning of wahum min kulli hadabin yansilun from every slope they shall send, descend now this is the tafsir of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu for the verse that after the time of Isa alayhi salam wa hum min kulli hadabin yansilun they shall descend down from every slope likewise the location of Ya'juj and Ma'juj where are they located meaning where is the barrier located Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu what's narrated from him in al tabari and Al-Qurtubi and others he said huwa fi munqati'i bilad turk it's in the Turkish lands not you know the if you read up on the Turkish lands the Turkish lands were not only in modern day Turkey it's all the the Central Asian lands all the way up to China even occupied Kashmir under China that would count as Turkic land that's why the people are Turkic in that occupied part of Kashmir. So from Kashmir all the way up to modern day Turkey, these are Turkic lands. In fact, Kashmir was ruled by Turkic people prior to the Mughal dynasty. So, Mimma Yeli Armenia wa Azerbaijan, meaning what is next to Armenia and Azerbaijan. This is referring to the area in Georgia. If you check Tafsir uh, Ruh al Ma'ani of Ismail Haqqi, you will find him making a mention of the Khazar Jews. He, he mentions it. But he says if you take the position of Abdullah bin Abbas that the barrier was located there, then there is a possibility that it is the Khazar Jews. But then he refutes the position. And he says it is not authentically reported from Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhuma. So it is reported from him, but whether it is authentic or not is questionable. Where did the idea come from that the Khazar Jews are in fact Ya'juj and Ma'juj? You will find this in early Christian sources. So uh, people who accepted Islam like Ka'ab al-Ahbar, they accepted Islam, but they were well versed in, the, in what we call the Bible today. They related many of the narrations of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, which have their roots in Israelite reports. So many of the reports that we may read from Wahab bin Munabbih or Ka'ab al-Ahbar, when you read these reports, some of the strange reports, like their ears are so big that when they go to sleep, they wrap themselves in their own ears or some of them are, are, are uh, an arm's length tall and arm's length wide, wide if you read these narrations remember they are from israelite reports so even if the chain of narration is authentic it doesn't mean it's from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's from ka'ab al-ahbar and wahab bin munabbih 
the idea that the Khazar Jews are the Ya'juj and Ma'juj from those tribes, this had its roots in early Christianity also. In fact, uh, there is an academic work written on this. So, this work, Gag and Magag, in early Eastern Christian and Islamic sources. Salam's quest for Alexander's wall. This work has been published by Brill, an academic work. In here, he has the reference to Ya'juj and Ma'juj in early Christian sources. But this book is an interesting book because the book mentions the journey of a man known as Salam. Salam at Tarjuman. Salam, the interpreter. He was commissioned by the Caliph Al Wathiq Billah. So the Abbasi Caliph Al Wathiq Billah commissioned this man to travel and find the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Al Wathiq Billah passed away in the year 847. Uh, not Islamic year, Christian calendar. 847. So this is. After the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, by over two hundred years, over two hundred years after the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he commissioned uh, Salam at Tarjuman to find the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I will read the account out to you shortly, to, uh, before the video. So, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam described and gave the physical description of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. In one khutbah sermon, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Innakum taquluna la aduwa lakum. You say you have no enemy. This was after they conquered uh, Makkah al-Mukarramah. And the companions thought they had no enemies. You say you have no enemy. Wa innakum la tazaluna tuqatiluna aduwan. You will never cease fighting enemies. Meaning enemies of the Muslims. Hatta yakhruja ya'juj wa ma'juj. Until ya'juj and ma'juj appear. Iradul wujuh. They will have broad faces. Sigarul uyun. Small eyes. Sahbun. Min kulli hadabin yansilun. Small noses. And they will descend from every slope. Ka'anna wujuhahum. Al-majanul mutraqah. As if their faces are like flat shields or hammered shields, meaning the shape of their face. This is the description of the Mongol people because there are authentic hadith mentioning the Mongolian invasion of Baghdad, even though Baghdad was not met, um, um, built at the time, it was built later. But this shows the, the miraculous aspect of the prophecy of the Prophet. That in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, there was no masjid in Damascus. There was no Islam in Damascus. There was no minaret in Damascus, Islamic minarets. Yet the Prophet ﷺ foretold that Isa ﷺ will descend at a minaret. Likewise, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ foretold the invasion of Baghdad. But there was no city as Baghdad. This narration, when scholars would look at the hadith, they would say the chain of narration is weak. Then 200 years after Khatib al-Khatib uh, al al-Baghdadi, Abu Bakr bin Ahmed, the, the author of Tariq Baghdad, 200 years after he compiled the Hadith work, Baghdad was invaded. And scholars then said the Hadith was authentic. Meaning, some people say the work of Nu'aym bin Hamad has numerous inauthentic Hadith. But many of the things have come about and many things will come about which authenticates the hadith. Nevertheless, the Mongol invasion is foretold in different hadith. So if someone says the Mong Mongolians are the Ya'juj and Ma'juj, which some scholars did think that, when the Mongolian invasions happened, because it shocked the Muslim world, they thought this is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Like some people are now reinterpreting Western civilization has been Ya'juj and Ma'juj. When this is incorrect, why do the Ya'juj and Ma'juj look similar to the Mongolians? Because they are descendants of the same race.
So this was a map that we will inshallah insert into the video later uh, of Georgia and the, the, the barrier itself. Of course, further proof given for uh, the Daryl Gorge being the actual gorge is because of the Black Sea. So uh, Zul Qarnayn Ali Salam, when he traveled to the to the to the west, he came across a black body of water beyond which the sun was setting on the horizon. Everyone knows the story from Al Quran Al Karim. So people say the Black Sea is nearby, therefore it's that location. But the video that I will show you, there is another another contender for that location also. Now, what is the hadith which relates to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sleeping in the night and he saw a dream regarding the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj? He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Waylun lil Arab, woe to the Arabs, min sharrin qad iqtarab, from an evil which has approached. What was opened from the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj similar to this. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ did this. That there was a small hole made in the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So Zainab radiallahu anha said, O Messenger of Allah, Afanahliku wafina as-salihun, will we perish? Even if there are pious people from amongst us, Qala Naam. He said, Yes, Ida Kathur al Khabath. If Khabath impurities increase, meaning uh, an indication towards zina, adultery, and fornication. So, this is the hadith that people cite to say that the barrier has been breached. Now, because the barrier has been breached, Therefore, they have been released. This is the hadith you cited to prove that fact. But the hadith mentions that a small hole was made. It doesn't mention a breach. But some people say, no, the, the hole was not this small. They cite uh, different citations to say the hole was big enough for men to come out. And Al-Imam Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, when commenting on Surah Al-Kahf, he mentions the Mongolians, and he says, maybe the Mongolians were the precursor to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So if someone tries reconciling between the two different opinions, they would say that the Mongolians are a precursor to Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and then the Western nations are also a precursor to Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and the last influx of Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come in the time of Isa This can make some sense. But again, it is not the mainstream opinion. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates, and this is a famous hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. They dig every day. They dig every day. When they are about to see the light of the, the sun, what do they do? The person who is in charge says, return. So they go back. He says, We shall dig it up tomorrow. When they go back, they come back and they find it back as it was, meaning sealed again completely. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills that they are released, the man who is in charge will say, Insha Allah, with the will of might of Allah. This means that they recognize a divine creator. Someone may ask, why are Ya'juj and Ma'juj thrown into hellfire if the message of Islam didn't reach them? Because the Quran says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We do not punish a people until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispatches a messenger. The response is that on the night of Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa conveyed the message of Islam to them. But someone may say the offspring, after hundreds of years, the message did not reach them. So why are they punished? The response is 
that the Maturidi position can be cited that according to Imam Abu Hanifa and others, that if someone, the message of Islam does not reach them, they should at least recognize a divine creator. This hadith is proof for that, that the, the, the caretaker, the one who looks over their affairs will say, Insha'Allah, meaning he recognizes a divine uh, God who will give, uh, will give divine permission for them to, to open the barrier. So when they come out, then فَيَرْمُونَ بِسِهَامِهِمْ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ They will shoot their arrows to the skies. فَتَرْجِعُ عَلَيْهِمْ بِدَمْ It shall come back to them with blood. Some people with their theories, they change every few hundred years. Decades ago, some of these people who ascribe to the theory that the Western nations are Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they said the, the arrows are the rockets. That NASA launches rockets and the communist Russians launch rockets. And then their rockets come back down, meaning Apollo 13 and others that were destroyed. These were some of the interpretations people gave. But they changed their theory. Uh, one of them, he said, first he said, Ya'juj is American, Ma'juj is uh, Russia. Now he's pro-Russia. So he says, I was wrong. Only the Western nations are Ya'juj and Ma'juj. These are the different theories that change. So they say, فَيَقُولُونَ قَهَرْنَ أَهْلَ الْأَرْضِ We have overwhelmed the people of the earth. وَعَلَوْنَ أَهْلَ السَّمَاءِ And we have, uh, we have conquered the denizens of the, of the heavens also. This is a famous hadith. So this means every day the, the Ya'juj and Ma'juj attempt to breach the barrier. Now, the famous hadith of An-Nawas ibn Sam'an radiyallahu anhu. An-Nawas ibn Sam'an radiyallahu anhu has a famous hadith which I cited in previous seminars, a long hadith, that after Isa alayhi salam descends, then kills uh, Ad-Dajjal, he will go into Jabal al-Tur, Ya'juj and Ma'juj will uh, surround Jabal al-Tur and the surrounding areas, and the Muslims will be unable to descend until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a disease in their necks, like an epidemic, and they shall die. Then what will happen? The Muslims will burn their arrows, the arrow sticks, for seven years. Meaning they will, they will have so many arrows that they will burn them. This hadith is very clear that Ya'juj and Ma'juj shall descend, shall, be, shall appear after the descent of Isa a.s. But of course the people who follow the other methodology, they will say, in response to that, they will say, the verse of the Qur'an comes first, therefore anything that contradicts the Qur'an, we reject the hadith. But the answer is that the verse of the Qur'an does not support your claim. Meaning the verse, Hatta idha futihat ya'juju wa ma'juj, does not support your claim. Because that verse is referring to the return of destroyed towns of the people back to Allah. That they cannot return until the signs of the Day of Judgment have occurred and the, the Day of Judgment occurs. This is what the verse refers to. It's a distortion of the verse of the Qur'an, that interpretation. Another narration also states that they shall ascend uh, unto Jabal al-Khamar in Palestine. Now Jabal al-Khamar, it's called Khamar because it has numerous trees. And they shall drink all the water prior, prior to ascending to the mountain of Jabal al-Khamar. So some people will say this has occurred now with the Israeli occupation. But we believe that this will occur in the end times after the descent of Isa alayhi salam. Again, there are numerous hadith. Some of them are repetitive, but I will not repeat some of them. Uh, we will go now to two final things before the questions and answer. One is the account of Salam at Tarjuman that Al Wathiq Billah dispatched. 
and the second will be the video where two contemporary people take an expedition to the area. So this uh, uh, Salam at Tarjuman He was a Jew, a Khazar Jew. So that's what makes it more interesting. A Khazar Jew is dispatched by the Muslim Khalifa to go and discover the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Firstly, this account is found in numerous Arabic sources and it did occur, but we will read one account. Salam, the interpreter, told me, meaning that the historian writes, when al wathiq Billah saw in his dream that it was as if the barrier which the two-horned one, meaning Dhul Qarnayn, had built between us and Gag Magag had opened, he looked for a man whom he could send out to the place for the barrier in order to seek information about it. So then he mentions the entire story. It's a very interesting story. If anyone needs the photocopies of this page, because the book costs over a hundred pound, meaning it's an academic work. Uh, less people read academic works, so the prices are high. So th at the end, he finds the barrier and he returns back. He says, uh, meaning over 30 men were dispatched with him. Half of them died on the way. And he mentions the various locations. And they found the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We arrived at Surah Man Ra'a. I was admitted to Al-Wathiq, told him the story and showed him the iron, which I had scraped from the gate. He praised God, ordered alms to be distributed and gave every one of the men 1,000 dinars. We had reached the barrier in 16 months and had returned in 12 months and some days. So that was his account of the journey. He himself was a Khazar Jew. And a meaning the Jews lived in peace and uh, harmony with the Muslims uh, in that time. Unfortunately, Zionism uh, corrupted them into meaning some of the, the occupying Jews. So, Salam al-Tarjuman mentions the Khaza Jews also. Now, why I cite this is because there are some people who are insistent that the Khaza Jews are Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Because they say the Muslims were unable to defeat them, which is untrue. They had numerous wars, but the Khaza Jews were defeated even by the Ukrainians. And eventually their empire was defeated and destroyed. They were dispersed. Many of them migrated to Europe. If they were Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they would never have been destroyed until Isa Ali Salam arrives. So this theory contradicts facts. But Salam at Tarjuman meets the Khazar Jews. So he writes, uh, in, uh, this is now the academic writing. In Al Mas'udi's days, Sarir was only two uh, parasangs, uh, what we call farsang, away, about six miles, I think, away from the Khazar town of Samandar which lay at, at an eight days march from Derbent. Salam's information about the, this part of his journey in the Caucasus seems confirmed by Ibn Rusta. According to the latter, the journey from Sari to the Khazars took 12 days through mountains and over meadows. The Khazars were one of two rival Turkish, by the way, Khazars are the current uh, occupiers, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and all these are Khazars. They, they are Turkic. So, two rival Turkish Khanates, the Khanates were the people who ruled Central Asia, which had emerged in Western Eurasia at the time of Salam. The other was that of the, uh, the Bulgars. From their capital, Atil, on the lower Volga, the Khazars dominated the trade routes from the North Caucasian steppe lands to the Middle Volga and from Kiev to Khwarezmia in modern Turkestan. They hold over the North Caucasus however, was disputed by the Arabs from 641 onwards. So because the Arabs are at war with them, people are, these were the people released from the Daryl Gorge. They were released from there 
and they, they kept the Arabs at bay. For over a century, a series of wars raged in the region. The possession of Durbant and one of the Khazar towns of Balanjar and Samandar, perhaps the winter and summer quarters of the ruling clan, was the major aim of both parties, meaning Arabs, Muslims, and the, the Khazars. Since the Filan Shah gave Salam a letter for the king of the Khazars, some sort of contact must have existed between this Caucasian Avar and the Khazar ruler, whose territory extended to the east of the Caspian Sea, where the Salam was about to depart. By the time the Caliph's envoy arrived in Khazaria, peace reigned between the Arabs and the Khazars. So, according to this, the Ya'juj and Ma'juj made peace with the Arabs whose last major incursion into Arab holdings in the uh, Transcaucasus had taken place in 799. Listen to this part, and this is especially for the people who ascribe to the other theory. The Khazards were allies of the Byzantines. They were allies of the Eastern Roman Empire. And until the 10th century, they remained the cornerstone of the Byzantine defense network against Eurasian nomads. So, additional to this, Islam, however, was prominent in the towns of the Khazar Empire. Islam was dominant. So, according to these accounts, if the Khazars were Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Islam was prevalent in their towns. They even made peace with the Muslims at some time. And additional to that, they were a barrier for the Eastern Orthodox uh, Byzantine Empire which according to uh, some of our would-be eschatologists like Imran Hussein, who believes that Putin is the savior uh, of the Muslim world and all other theories he comes out with and that the Muslims should return Hagia Sophia back to Eastern Orthodox Christians. According to him, the Khazars are Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So according to him, the Khazar Ya'juj and Ma'juj, meaning this would have to be his conclusion. The Khazar Ya'juj and Ma'juj had an alliance with the Eastern Orthodox Christians. How do we respond to his claim that the Hagia Sophia should be returned? A simple response. Any city that is conquered by force by the Muslims with no treaty, with warmongers, meaning the, the people are aggressive towards Islam, the Muslims conquer their cities. If the ruler decides to convert a church in that scenario into a masjid, he is permitted. But if it is open through peaceful means, then we are not permitted. What is the proof? Al Jami al Umuwi, the Grand Umayyad Masjid in Damascus, was previously a church. Who conquered uh, Damascus? The Sahaba. When the Sahaba conquered it, they made al Jamil al umwi because it was conquered by force into a masjid. But when they peacefully conquered Jerusalem, they did not convert any of the churches. Big distinction. So Imran Hussein needs to answer this point. Now we will go on to the video, insha'Allah ta'ala. A video of where some travelers, one Egyptian and one Central Asian Muslim, they go to the location of the barrier which Salam had witnessed. So as we play the video, I will give you a running commentary, inshallah. This is Salam at Tarjuman's map. So the map, al wathiq Billah. This map, an old ancient map of the route that a Salam at Tarjuman took through various territories, including the Khazar Empire. As he mentioned, it took 16 months and he took 30 men and half of them died on the way and they were reimbursed by the Khalifa al wathiq Billah. He even gave blood money. Now he uses Google Maps to go to the same area. As he goes to using Google Maps, he locates a barrier in Kyrgyzstan, modern day Kyrgyzstan. So outwardly the barrier looks like a snow covering, 
between two mountains. A snow covering between two mountains. So this is a, a modern map and this is the ancient map. I have copies of this also. This is the ancient map that they took. Even though the researcher of this book doesn't mention Kyrgyzstan. He believes that it was the Great Wall of China they observed and they came back. So this now is the barrier, a picture of the barrier on Google Maps. So people say, where is the barrier on Google Maps? So if you notice, these are two mountain passes. As the Quran describes, Bain of Sadafain. Sadafain is the two tips of a mountain. And they are also described in the Quran as Saddain. So between the two, a barrier is made. So these are the individuals who leave. They go to Kyrgyzstan now, taking uh, guides with them to go through the mountain range. So these mountains are some of the highest mountains in the world. And the people are horse. Uh, they use horse uh, to, to scope the mountains still to this day, similar to the Mongols. And if you look at the flag of Kyrgyzstan, it has a sun. So Zul Karnayn alayhi salam journeyed out to find where the sun sets and where the sun rises. This is mentioned. There is an additional video to this with uh, Genghis Khan's uh, history and how uh, the, uh, and regarding the water, the black lake. There is a black lake in Kyrgyzstan as well with black water which fits the description of the Quran. So now they pass through all these mountain passes So uncharted territory. At this point they rest for the night. So they camp out in, in the wilderness. At this point, he's just describing what food he's eating uh, for the night. Of course, the original video is in Arabic. Otherwise, we would have played the sound. Now the next morning, they depart from the campsite to the actual barrier. So one of them will board a plane with the army of Kyrgyzstan and the other one will go by foot uh, using donkeys and mules. So the terrain fits the uh, stereotypical description of Ya'juj and Ma'juj terrain as well as the physical description of the Kyrgyzstani people or the people in that locality. Now they plan out the journey. Uh, this is the Egyptian researcher. He will be boarding a plane and the native people will be going uh, by mules. So they prepare for the journey, a bit similar to Salam al Tarjuman, because he mentions they took with them mules and donkeys. So they needed mules and donkeys to, to research the, the terrain. So they ascend now using the mules or ponies.
now this is through the pass, the, the passing that we saw on the Google Maps. The side video is showing the Egyptian researcher boarding a plane with the army. So the army now will take him by plane uh, with the helicopter, sorry, to, to have a bird's eye view of the barrier. While the more interesting journey is the, the men on the ponies because they will come across some interesting artifacts. He's planning the journey now with the army officers. And remember, what's interesting is that they've used Salam Tarjuman's map. And using a Salam Tarjuman's map, they found an actual barrier on Google Map. Using Google Map, they're actually flying and, tr and going by mules to the location. So it will be interesting for us now to see what they actually discover. So now they cannot even use mules. They must use backpacks. So they take the backpacks to ascend. As they march through, he finds man-made iron blocks. So this is one of the interesting finds. So iron blocks that were man-made, they will show those blocks that are lying around the region of the wall. So this is one block made from iron, but this, the as you can see, that's man-made, that's done by men, that's not done by uh, nature. As you notice, uh, the mountains are clear of any snow, but when they reach the barrier, there will be snow covering the barrier. This is because iron is cold and the, the ice remains on the barrier throughout the year because of the cold iron. So initially when you, were gonna, when you will see the barrier, you will think this is just snow. But then what they will do is get ice picks and uh, break through the ice and then use metal detectors to show that the, it's an actual iron barrier. So as they fly now, this flat ice that you observe is an actual barrier. What it covers is between two mountain tops and what's behind that, as they believe, is Ya'juj and Ma'juj, the tribe. This would mean that the backside of the mountain is covering, the, covering Ya'juj and Ma'juj like a roof, so like a huge 
a cave or a huge tunnel that goes underground. So that would mean the, the two sides of the mountain cover them and also the top of the mountain and the, the, the Ya'juj and Ma'juj were a mountain civilization that was embedded inside of the mountain and this barrier is covering them. This is if we follow this claim. I'll give my conclusion at the end. So this is now the back part of the mountain. So there's no way that someone can penetrate the inside of the mountain because all parts are covered. So that's the backside. But then the man-made area is the front. They claim that the front is the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. When this side where the snow is showing. And they're saying that the snow and the ice remains throughout the year because the barrier is cold. So therefore the, the snow is retained. So this part they would claim is the barrier. So these are the stones he shows again, uh, the iron man-made stones, as you can see blocks, these are actual blocks of iron that are man-made. So these are, if the claim is true then these are the remnants of some kind of dynamites that blew <coughs> or some tools that were used to make iron blocks. They have a Sheikh Sha'rawi playing in the original video, re re reciting some tafsir, uh, mentioning some commentary on the Surah Al-Kahf. Of course, a Sheikh Sha'rawi never ascribed to this position. This is a more recent discovery. If we uh, dismiss uh, the discovery of a Salam Tarjuman. So they would claim that is the barrier and the two ends are the Sadafain and the rest of the mountain is covered. So if you remove the barrier there is an entrance into the mountain. So this would mean an underground civilization or a mountain civilization. That is a better view, as you can see. It would take more independent scholars to travel out to Kyrgyzstan and verify this slope uh, with more meticulous methods. If any of you are hikers and fit enough to go, then we can arrange some kind of journey to Kyrgyzstan. I'm sure the mountains of Yorkshire help uh, in, in reaching some type of fitness. So now what they will do is they will hang, uh, go down the slope, cut away some of the ice and then check for the metal. So this is a top view of the mountain and of the uh, claimed barrier. They are claiming if you remove the ice, underneath is a barrier made from iron blocks. This is the claim. So he d has descended and now he cuts out some of the ice and then uses a metal detector.
Here in writing they claim those, that view is the two mountains on either side which were from where Ya'juj and Ma'juj would appear and this barrier blocks them from coming out. Now he utilizes the metal detector. So in the original video you would hear the bleeping of the metal detector. It shows positive for metal. So there is metal behind the ice. They claim this is the barrier, the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So wherever he moves the metal detector, there is a bleeping sound. And this is to show, they throw an object down to show that the smooth surface is because it's a flat wall, not a natural, not a natural wall. And this is a final view of what they claim is the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Of course, uh, this will be disputed by people present. Uh, I'm, I am not claiming this is conclusive. I, I just found this to be an interesting piece of research. The fact that they went out their way to research it, uh, we should commend them for that. Okay, this is showing the minaret in Damascus from where Isa al -Salam shall descend. This is the minaret. How do we conclude this subject of Ya'juj and Ma'juj? How I would conclude the subject is anything that I've mentioned is not mustahil aqlan, is not rationally impossible that a group of people or civilization be contained within a barrier, behind a barrier which is covered by mountains, as well as the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can hide them wherever he wills, and this can defy Google Maps and satellites, and when they appear they will be huge in comparison to the small number of Muslims that will exist on the face of the earth. But do we conclude that this is the barrier or the Daryal Gorge is the barrier? How do we conclude that? Meaning, that what is the conclusion? The answer is that when the sign will occur, no doubt remains in the mind of a Muslim. So if the sign has occurred, there will be no doubt. But it is clear for all that the sign has not occurred because Isa a.s. has not descended as well as the, the remaining doubts that are established. So that is how I will conclude the subject of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Firstly, through Al-Qur'anul Karim. Our first source of protection is Al-Qur'anul Karim. Every Friday recite the entire Surah Al-Kahf. Chapter number 18 of Al-Quran Al-Kareem. If you are unable to recite Surah Al-Kahf, then recite the first 10 verses and the last 10 verses. If you are unable to recite the last 10 verses, then just recite the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. Additional to this, have a wird, a litany that you recite from Al-Quran Al-Kareem every day, like Surah Yaseen, Surah Al-Mulk. Surah Al-Waqi'ah. So attaching ourselves to Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem. Increasing our memorization of Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem. Secondly is knowledge. Increasing our knowledge of Qur'an and Sunnah. Meaning not to be like the ignorant followers of the shiukh who talk about the end of times and they have no knowledge themselves. They rely solely on the shaykh. Read up on subjects like I mentioned reading of Ali Shah Ali Ashrat al of Barzanji. This is essential reading. Or al usas wal Muntaliqat of a Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Mashur. These are essential readings. Uh, books like Iqdud Durar, Fi Akhbar al-Muntazar. Increasing our knowledge of Quran and Sunnah. 
من القرآن الكريم عن the أحاديث of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Thirdly, increasing our ibada because the hadith states uh, regarding times of fit and tribulation that when tribulation occurs, al ibada acts of worship in the time of tribulation is like migrating to the Prophet ﷺ. So increasing our worship, meaning praying five times a day, attempting to pray our salawat, our prayers in the masjid, especially the fajr prayer. And then increasing our nawafil, like tahajjud, qiyamul layl, uh, awwabin, when the sunrise happens, praying salawa, uh, salah, uh, uh, which is known as salatul duha, awwabin is after maghrib prayer, increasing our worship and avoiding sins. The fourth is investing your wealth, your cash, in gold and land. Two things. If you have savings, you should be buying gold and land. Two things. You will thank me for this advice in years to come. Rather than saving cash, except for the cash that you need at the moment, if you have large amounts of cash, buy gold with that cash and land. These are two good investments. For instance, in Wales, you can buy two acres of land for, uh, for 40,000 pounds. Two acres of land in Wales is better than having £40,000 in the bank. Because you can utilise that as a farm. You can utilise that as a, a, a place to build a house. Land will always increase in price and never decrease. Remember most wars are for land. Then they are for water and gold. So, and buy blocks of gold. But in this country you are taxed for gold. So how you bypass that is buy the gold sovereigns as collector's items. They are still solid gold, but you will bypass the tax laws. So invest in gold and land. Of course, many of you becoming happy that I'm giving material advice. Take the spiritual advice also. The fifth is a water source. Always be near a water source that if uh, the water is cut off, you are near a water source. In Yorkshire, you will not have that problem. Yes, you will have wells. But identify those wells, identify the rivers, identify a watering source, sanitation. Do not follow the way of people in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan, where they have, the people have no common sense of sanitizing water. So many people excrete in water and then they suffer from cholera in those countries. And then you have a mosquito problem because they have no sewage uh, system. And then mosquitoes spread uh, diseases like malaria and people die from those things because of lack of sanitization. This is something the, the Khan government should be working on first. Sanitizing water. If you want a Medina society, uh, place, uh, fix the, the watering system and the sewage system. If you want a Medina society, replace the paper money with gold and silver. If you want a Medina society, finish taxes and collect zakat. Finish taxes and collect jizya. Finish taxes and collect kharaj. Finish taxes and collect ushar. Finish taxes uh, and reintroduce the Islamic economic system. This is the only way of re-establishing the Medina system. So water, make sure you have wa a watering source. It's good to invest in those water containers that clean out the water also. There's, there are watering systems you can get that they clean out the tap water from all its chemicals. So that is a good thing to invest in. Number six, have a log burner. Someone may think this is something small. No, you, have, you can buy devices to burn logs in. And if you have enough money, change the, the system in your house now 
where you bur with the log burner you can you can warm your own water and you can warm your own house like that you will not rely on the gas and electric you will not rely on gas and electric companies so if you have a log burner by which you can burn wood maybe you can only use it in emergencies likewise the solar panels place solar panels in your house but have a log burner by which you can warm uh, water you can cook food and uh, you can warm the house and you can uh, do different things with the log burner alone i'm sure there's many people are more intelligent than me in these regards I mean, you can ask and inquire how to do this how to place this system in the house where uh, the log burner warms all the water and all the rooms around the house point number seven go back to farming and raising animals the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions that a man who runs away from tribulations raising goats and sheep and cattle and animals uh, he praises that person who goes away in the wilderness to raise animals go back to raising animals and farming for people from Kashmir they can go back to farming and also have the reward of ribat ribat is standing in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to defend your land because the Indian army is on the border so if you have land in Kashmir open farms in Kashmir you won't fall into the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa foretold in the end of times there will be people who will farm but they will abandon jihad. A group of people who will farm but abandon jihad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall subjugate them with an enemy. But no, if you are in Kashmir or Palestine, you farm the land but you are also murabitun, you are also defending your land according to the law of that country and international law also. So going back to farming and grazing animals. But if you cannot go to to Kashmir or other places then buy land in Wales buy land in Yorkshire and uh, meaning a few of you if you come together you can um, you can invest in land in the UK also this brings me to my final point which people always mention do we have to migrate I say no why because the entire world has become a global culture Whatever bad effect you are running away from here, you will find sometimes worse things in Muslim countries. Yes, anyone who has experience of Muslim countries will know. So rather than running away from the UK, invest in the UK, buy gold and land here in the UK and start farms, Muslim farms in the UK. Someone, some people say we should leave the UK, but look at the infrastructure in the Muslim world that the Muslim uh, rulers will uh, give you more hassle in terms of your farming and different things than uh, the UK government will. So you do not need to migrate. You can start investing as groups. So for instance in Halifax, you have a group of Muslims that invest in a farm. Then everyone can go to that farm and buy their local produce. You can have 20 people investing in a farm. If someone says it costs too much, then get if you get 50 people investing 1,000 pound, for a non-profit farm and then you allocate one person to run the farm who will get a wage from the farm and the rest of you can go and buy your dairy and products and uh, your milk and different things, natural things, keeping the farm running, the local community can keep the farm running. Why is this important? If there is an economic crash tomorrow, your paper money or your money is worthless but your farm will be worth something your animals will be worth something your gold will be worth something so these are the best guidelines i gave thought to this that i can give for people on the akhir zaman not to despair you carry on with life you carry on with life but if you carry how many guidelines nine but there are nine guidelines if you follow these nine guidelines inshallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you of course there's dua as well Many du'as you can do. Go through al adhkar of Al-Imam Al-Nawi. You'll find different du'a that people can recite to protect themselves from tribulation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our efforts. Amen.
and strengthen us in the end of times that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us strong iman first and most important strong iman secondly that he strengthens us in our ibadah our worship thirdly he gives us mental spiritual and physical health and well-being fourthly that our material well-being is good that he safeguards our worldly wealth and our spiritual wealth and I've given you guidelines to do that invest in land and invest in gold safeguard your wealth uh, an additional thing I would say is look after your health also. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this from us. Aqulu qawli adha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Jazallahu anna sayyidana muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amahu ahluh. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. This was a very successful event. It's been very, uh, we've had, this is the fourth event. Alhamdulillah, uh, completely packed out. And so many of you sat toward the end. This shows your eagerness to learn and so many people online. This shows that there is a need for this subject. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He accepts this and makes it for solely for his sake. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.